Dennis Wagner. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dennis Wagner. I'm the director of the Quality Improvement and Innovation Group here at CMS. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to the CMS Quality Conference, formerly known as QualityNet. We're going to get cracking here. If I could have my first slide, getting some feedback. Y'all hear that? A little bit of feedback. Not sure what we can do on that. So Frank, if you could give me my first slide. I'd like to begin this morning by just recognizing and introducing the folks that we have here in the room. Um, we've got an extraordinary event over the course of the next three days, and it's much bigger than this event has ever been in the past. Last year we had 1,250 people at the conference, and this year we have over 2,000 folks who are registered and a lot of additional people who are seeking to get in. Um, so we've got really a very, very large event, and it's going to be a great one. I'd like to begin by just acknowledging the quality improvement organizations who are in the room. And if I could invite the Quinn QIOs and the BFCC QIOs to please stand. All right. How, how about our end stage renal disease networks? And I want to invite the support contractors for these organizations to stand as well. How about our hospital engagement networks? I have the hospital engagement networks, please stand. And your support contractors. The first ever face-to-face -face meeting of those organizations that are involved in the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative is this meeting. And I want to invite the Practice Transformation Networks and their support contractors to please stand. All right. Our support and alignment networks. We have 10 very influential, powerful support and alignment networks. If I could invite those folks to please stand. Welcome. We're going to hear this morning shortly from Vicki Wachino, the director of the Centers for Medicaid and CHIP Services. And I know that we have a number of our state partners who are here today. And I'd like to invite our state partners to please stand. Who do we have here from the states? All right. <laughs> Welcome. Um, all, I understand, all the regional health collaboratives are going to be here. We'll have a session this afternoon for the regional health collaboratives. First time that they've been formally invited as an entire group. I, if I could invite the regional health collaboratives to please stand as well. There's a very large federal team at CMS that supports this work. Um, but we also have many colleagues from ARC and CDC and other parts of the government, the Department of Defense, VA. If our federal team could please stand, I'd like to just give us a line of sight on who we have from the federal government. All right. Excellent. And then we have a whole variety of private partners, researchers, students, and other folks. I don't want to leave anyone out, so if I haven't called on you, the exception of a very special group of patients that I want to recognize in a few moments. Could I invite you to please stand? If you're here as a partner or a researcher, maybe a student, a category. All right, that's good. That's very good news. I often run the risk of leaving folks out, and I don't think anybody's been left out. I want to conclude this, this introduction, this self-introduction of who we have by calling on the patients and the family representatives that have joined us for this quality conference. We are absolutely delighted with the inclusion of patients in our work. I know we've got a lot of folks from the ESRD networks who are here and others as well. If I could have our patient family members, please stand. All right. All right. So do I have a pickle here, Frank? Excellent. And if I push this, will I get a slide? Terrific. Let's go ahead and do that. All right. So I'm pushing it, Frank, but I'm not seeing a slide. <laughs> Are you? You're seeing them. Oh, excellent. So that's good. You're seeing them. Um, now, I'm not seeing them. So does this slide that, that you're seeing, does it say something like um, patient family engagement? 
<laughs> now, there we go. Okay. Well, I guess this comes with being the first speaker. You get to test run um, everything that we've got going here. All right. All right. Hey. hey. <laughs> now, if we could get this feedback under control, we'd be in really good shape. Um, so I just want to say, we've introduced the patients that we have in the room. Um, patient family engagement is key to the work that we're doing. Uh, this is something that Don Berwick in particular, um, when he was our administrator, said we need to do more of this. And if you think about it, it just makes so much sense. The patients and the families that we serve have the most at stake. It's their lives and their health that we're, we're working with. They have a lot to contribute, and the demands of the healthcare system today are calling on patients and families to contribute more all the time. They're the constant factor in their own care across many different organizations. So they're contributing a lot, and we need to channel that in smart ways and team with patients in smart ways. They increase urgency. Um, I see Bob and Barbara Melisa right here in the front. Uh, the contribution that you made to the work of the Partnership for Patients by telling your story and giving your voice to that work was extraordinary. You help us break through barriers. It's hard to say, oh, well, this can't be done when someone like Barb and Bob Meliza in the room talking about what happens when we don't get it right. Um, um, it, it's so important. It's, it's an authentic contribution that patients and families make, and we're grateful for that. We think it's important to begin the conference with the voice of the patient, and so I'm gonna roll just a very short one-minute videotape that profiles some of the experience of, experiences of patients in our ESRD networks. If we could roll the video, we'll get to practice that here too. So I'll just say there's some beautiful music that accompanies this, but we're not, <laughs> we're not hearing that music. Not sure what's up with that. You're going to hear from a few moments from Jim Denny. I want to take just a moment and, sh and just invite Jim Deneen, who's right here up front, a patient representative, um, to make a few comments, Jim, about what you're most looking forward to over the course of the next three days. Uh, Jim comes from the Cincinnati area, uh, has worked with the ESRD networks 9 and 10 for some time. Tell us what you're thinking, Jim. Twelve years ago, November the 11th, I received a transplant from uh, my wife of 50 plus years. I realize I look 28, but it was, <laughs> she was an older woman. Um, <laughs> I, I, have, uh, I have, over the 12 years, um, always said that I owe um, my health to two groups or two people. One is my wife, Joyce. And the other is to people like yourselves who made it possible for some of us patients to uh, continue in a, in a healthy lifestyle. So I hope to learn more so that we can go back and help other patients uh, get to the same position that we're in. And um, I'm also here to just say thank you for what you've all done. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Jim, and thank you to all the other patients and family representatives that we have in the room here. So I want to take just a few moments and talk about what we're going to do over the course of the next three days. We've talked about who we've got in the room, but like, what's the nature of the work that we're doing together here? And I think this slide just kind of quickly describes sort of the heart of the work that we'll be doing together over the course of the next three days. We're going to network, we're going to create relationships, we're going to strengthen the ones that we have, share best practices, learn, learn together, make sense of our shared work. I want to pause on that one for just a moment. Make sense. So sense making is a big part of what we're doing together. The nation's investment in quality improvement through the QIO program, the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, the ESRD networks, all of the initiatives that are represented in this room is a very significant investment. And we have an accountability 
to figure out how to maximize the impact of our shared work. And that means teaming. That means teaming in new ways to harmonize our technical assistance so that we're not duplicative, so that we're preventing duplication of effort and we're maximizing synergy and impact for the patients and the providers that we're serving. So the sense-making work goes on up here. You're gonna hear from people like Patrick Conway and Gene Moody Williams, the administrator of CMS, Don Berwick, David Blumenthal, national leaders who will help us to make sense of the environment that we're working in. But I wanna challenge each and every person in this room. That's a shared accountability. We have to make sense of our work with each other. It's something that we do together. And I wanna really invite you to sort of not only use the conference for learning sense-making from leaders, but to contribute to that sense-making in very powerful ways. And to extend that when you go back home and you're working with your teams in the field that aren't able to be with us here today. Now, the other thing I want to just touch on briefly is networking. Um, I came to Washington in 1986 as a presidential management intern. There were a group of 186 of us distributed across federal agencies. And if there was one thing all these young, ambitious people wanted to do, it was to network. You know, we were very ambitious, we were very interested in having a large national impact, we were eager to do that, and we wanted to network. And I went to a session as a PMI on networking, and the gentleman who led it says, you know, people have networking wrong most of the time. Networking, a lot of people come to networking thinking, what is it that I can get out of this relationship or out of this possibility? And what you need to do when you network. This is the best piece of advice I ever got on networking, and I want to share it with you as we head in the next three days. Many of you know this already. Many of you are experts at it. But the way that you network most effectively is you give. You find ways to give. You find ways to help other people. And I want to challenge all of us as we network over the next three days, in the coming weeks, and the months, and the years that we have ahead, to constantly be focused on that business of networking that's based on giving, on supporting other people. There are masters of that that you're going to hear from. Patrick Conway is a master of that. Don Berwick is a master of that. Gene Moody Williams is a master of that. That's the kind of work that we want to do together. Now, the last point, though, I think is key. We need to use this event to generate action, commitments, and next steps. We want to leave this room having committed to doing things that we didn't plan on doing when we came. We want to augment and strengthen our strategies for having an impact. And this is what it looks like. We've got 2,000 people at this event. So if you think about it, 2,000 people. If we each leave here with 10 commitments for actions that we didn't plan when we first came, think of the power of that. That's 20,000 new commitments. 20,000 new commitments by the people in this room, the leaders that are assembled here, that's what makes the world turn. That's what causes the national results that we're seeking. And speaking of national results, you're going to hear shortly from the CMS administrator, Andy Slavitt, and he's going to share with you some of the collective impact that we're having in our work together, particularly around patient safety. So what's some of the other work that needs doing? This is some of the networking that we need to do. We need to figure out how to help each other. And some of the help that's needed, you see outlined on this slide. This is just a short list. Teaming among PTN, SANS, and QIOs on recruiting 140,000 clinicians into the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. Initiating work on brand new ESRD contracts for the first time that were awarded just yesterday. Sharing best practices among Quinn QIOs to tackle the challenges that are associated with each of the tasks of the 11th scope. I want to call out in particular behavioral health. The agency just made some awards in the behavioral health arena, and we're hearing it's difficult to recruit the numbers of, of practices into the behavioral health work. So we need to focus on who's succeeding in this, what's working, so that we can spread that quickly across the entire Quinn QIO network and get those folks signed up for the behavioral health work. Teaming among PTN, SANS, SIMS, QIOs, and others to prevent duplication of effort. This is a key thing. We don't want to spend the federal government's money, the taxpayers' money, twice for the same purpose. We also don't want to create rigid rules that keep people from working together. So solving that challenge means that each of the people in this room need to figure out smart ways to team and harmonize the technical assistance that you're providing so that you're coming up with local solutions state-level solutions that work for you, as opposed to sort of command control dictates from CMS. That's a big part of the work that we need to do together. Now, in addition to the work, there's always this business of, like, how am I going to be in this work? How am I going to be in this work? And so I want to very specifically make a request of you. So think of this slide, and what you see on this slide is a request. 
I want to invite all of us to be these ways over the course of the next three days. I would even say, let's be these ways over the course of the coming year, right? Like if we could do this, if we can be these ways, engaged and contributing, collaborative, open, solution seeking. So solution seeking, like what's that mean? Like we have problems, right? Problems need solutions. So I wanna invite you as you participate in the extraordinary sessions that are coming over the, the course of the next three days, I wanna invite you as you name the problem, name the, the possible solution. Name your thought about how we get to that solution or another solution. Constantly be teaming with us in that way. Authentic, in action, making requests and offers and generating net forward energy. Now, this slide was a request, so let me just check in. Can I have a collective head nod? Like, are we willing to kind of seek to be these ways together over the next three days? Yeah, 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 all right, I'm seeing some nods. Okay, good, thank you, thank you. That's, so that's my first request, right? I think that turned out pretty well. So I'm gonna do one more. Now, generating net forward energy. So what's that about, generating net forward energy? I remember, about 10 years ago, Don Berwick spoke at a national learning session on organ donation. And he said, he said, look, this has been a great event. He was closing it down for us, right? He said, you think of yourself almost like squirrels. You're here at this event and you're gathering acorns of energy from each other. Because when you go back home, you're gonna need to eat those acorns because the world's gonna be coming at you. you know? It isn't gonna be 10 things, it's 110 things that come at us every single day. So let's use this conference to collect that energy that will help to sustain us as we move forward. Now to do that, we have to generate that energy, right? And there's kind of two sorts of energy in the world that you see described on this slide. I wanna invite you, all of us, to team together in generating, to, to, to working on the left-hand side, the positive slide of this ledger, right? And if we do that, um, we create the kind of meeting that moves us forward. Now, not all meetings move people forward, right? Like, here's a picture of a meeting where you go backward. Like, if you have more negatives than positives, this is a very simple construct. This comes from Doug Krug, by the way, Enlightened Leadership. So if you're interested in reading more about this, it's a great book. So how many of you have been in a meeting where there's more negatives than positive and you go backward? Has anybody had that experience? <laughs> yeah, like maybe yesterday, huh? Yeah, like we've all had that experience, right? That's not the experience we want here. The experience we want here looks like this. We wanna have net forward energy. And having that has to do with how we conduct ourselves, how we be, how we choose to interact with each other. So I wanna invite you to join with us in generating net forward energy. Now, how many people feel like you can generate net forward energy? Like, can you sign up for that? Can that be part of what we're doing? Excellent. Thank you very much. So I've reached the end. Let me just check in. Vicki made it. Terrific. <laughs> so I get to hand off to an extraordinary leader here at CMS who is the deputy administrator and the director for the Center for Medicaid. She says she doesn't need a mic. Chino. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Yeah, it sounds much better. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me this morning, and it's an honor to join Jean and Dennis in welcoming you all to the 2015 CMS Quality Conference and seeing such a great and large group here uh, dedicated to improving quality for consumers like the people we have right here um, at the front table. It's very exciting to be with you to talk and think for several days about the role that Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP play in advancing quality throughout the health system and throughout the lives of Americans. In just a few minutes, you're going to hear from Andy Slavitt and Patrick Conway, and they're gonna talk with you about the agency's agenda for delivery system reform, the new 2016 CMS quality strategy. Um, and I learned some time ago not to steal your boss's material, so I'm not gonna to talk to you about any of that. Uh, I'm really here this morning to celebrate. And what I'm celebrating is that this is the first CMS quality conference um, at which Medicaid has been fully integrated into the conference. Historically, we've done our own separate conference, but now we're here as a full participant. We have three plenaries, 15 different breakout sessions, 
for all conference registrants. And I can't tell you how excited uh, I and my team are to be here. Uh, and as a way of celebrating that, I just wanted to talk with you about the role that Medicaid and CHIP are playing in advancing the quality of care throughout our healthcare system, the leadership role that these programs are playing that really reflects the role um, that they play in the healthcare system. More than 72 million Americans are enrolled in these programs right now. And Medicaid and CHIP together account for more than 16% uh, of all spending in the healthcare system. And so when we think about quality um, at CMS as it pertains to Medicaid and CHIP, we think about uh, how we leverage our role in meeting the needs of the low-income population our programs serve in the best way possible. We also think about how is it that Medicaid and CHIP can use that leverage that we have in the healthcare system to really drive quality forward. Of course, we celebrated uh, Medicare, Medicaid's birthday this year. Medicaid and Medicare, which are really sister programs, turned 50. CHIP turned 18 this year, which I suppose makes it the millennial of the group, but no less august in its accomplishments, particularly in the, in the role it's played over the past decade in reducing the uh, rate of uninsured children in the United States. And you probably saw the data that came out just last month that showed historically the rate of uninsured children is at an all-time low in the United States, which really reflects the role that both Medicaid and CHIP are playing in providing coverage to some of the most vulnerable people in America. Two of the th areas of, that we've spent the most time in Medicaid and CHIP and where we've played a clear forward-leaning role is in quality and measurement. Um, in 2011, Medicaid and CHIP established the first ever core set of quality measures for children, setting a model and driving quality forward, not just in our programs, but setting a model for commercial payers in the private sector as well. We built on that accomplishment in 2012 by establishing a core set of adult quality measures. And right now we have 26 adult quality, quality measures across six domains. And we work actively with states to, to improve and expand reporting on these measures. State reporting is voluntary, and our team at CMS works hand in glove with states. Uh, to advance quality and to improve measurement, uh, including by establishing and releasing the first ever grants to help states report on the adult quality measures. And of course, measuring quality and supporting states in an effort is important. But underlying our ability to succeed in treating, measuring the quality of, and improving the health care of these populations is having comprehensive coverage. And for adults in particular, Having comprehensive coverage through Medicaid expansion is critical to improving the health status and improving the quality of life and the quality of care. Uh, right now, 30 states have expanded coverage and in addition to the District of Columbia, and CMS is working tirelessly with other states to try to develop approaches to expansion that work for them. Now, as this audience well knows, uh, improving the quality of care is about a lot more than measurement. And Medicaid and CHIP have played a leadership role in developing solutions and, improve, and quality improvement efforts that have really led the nation in a couple of key areas. We're pioneering approaches to improving maternal and infant health through our Strong Start initiative, which has been a key priority of CMS's for several years and really reflects the role that Medicaid plays uh, in financing births in the country, uh, you may not know that Medicaid finances nearly half of all births in the United States, 48%. So when we improve maternal and infant health in the country, Medicaid needs and does play a very big role in that endeavor. Medicaid is also pioneering measure development in the area of community long-term services and supports. Uh, nationally, we finance half of all long-term care in the country, and half of that spending takes place in home and community-based settings, a milestone that we just reached this year. And our team is working actively to try to develop quality measures 
uh, that account for the health status and the needs of vulnerable people with disabilities and seniors who want to remain in their homes, want to remain independent, want to direct their own caregivers. So we're spending a lot of time on that topic and leading the way there as well. And of course, Medicaid is also making major strides forward in improving the treatment of substance use disorder. Uh, which is a key priority of ours and also supports broader HHS goals of addressing, addressing the opiate edemic, epidemic in America. We're also working on uh, pr promoting integration of physical and behavioral health, continuing to make progress in community-based long-term services and supports. And to support all of this work and more, we last year established an innovation accelerator program uh, which is now in its second year and designed to provide program support to states to strengthen their delivery systems. And uh, if that wasn't enough for you, you can hear about more about all of these topics uh, in the sessions offered through our Medicaid program at this conference. Now, while we in CMCS are very proud of that record, we also know there's much more work today to do. Uh, one key goal of ours has been making eligibility and coverage as simple and seamless for people to enroll in as possible. And that's important to quality, because in order to, to manage quality of care, you need to have people in, who, are, who are eligible in our programs enrolled. That's why I'm very pleased to announce today that later this week, CMCS is going to publish in the Federal Register a final regulation that establishes a substantially enhanced 90% matching rate for eligibility and enrollment systems that are geared at supporting states' efforts at uh, enrolling people in Medicaid and CHIP coverage simply, seamlessly, and with minimal consumer burden. Next year, you can look to us to finalize our Medicaid managed care regulations, which also made very substantial investments in the quality area. And the area uh, within the reg that I would most call out to your attention is a proposal we made last year to establish a quality rating system for Medicaid and CHIP for the first time modeled after comparable five-star rating systems in Medicare Advantage and in qualified health plans. Uh, our team right now is reviewing the 800 comments we received on the rule. Uh, and if you commented on them, thank you so much. Uh, and we're trying to finalize it next year. It's a huge priority for us. My last task for this morning is going to be to introduce Jean Moody Williams. But before I do that, um, I wanted to just thank my team, my CMCS team, who's worked so hard on quality over many years and worked so hard to put this conference together. One person in particular who I wanted to thank is Marsha Lily Blanton, who's our chief quality officer and directs our quality division. I'm looking for Marsha and not quite seeing her. Uh, she's, she's, there she is. Yay, Marsha. Um, <laughs> If you haven't had the chance to meet Marcia yet, let me tell you a little bit about what you're missing. Uh, I've known Marcia for 15 years and had the great privilege of working with her closely for most of the past five years. And I will just tell you that there is no one who is more committed to uh, improving the health, uh, improving the quality of care, and improving access for the low-income population consistently over the course of the time I've worked with her. Marcia has been a visionary leader in connecting the different parts of CMS to each other, making sure that all of our different pieces of our programs, whether it's our EQRO requirements, uh, whether it's our measurement programs, really support the broader goals of the program. And every one of the accomplishments that we've had I've, that I've just described to you has benefited from for Marsha's intelligence, her diligence, and her tireless leadership. So Marsha, thank you for all you do. Speaking of people, so, thank you. <laughs> thank you for reminding me to clap. So speaking of people who know a lot about quality and work tirelessly to that goal, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jean Moody Williams. There's so much that I could say about Jean, and she's probably familiar to all of you already. Um, she is a clinician, she is a published author. Within CMS, she leads a portfolio of work so broad and important it defies categorization, but she works on ESRD, on value-based purchasing, 
on our um, clinical standards, on our survey and certification. Um, and she's broadly recognized as a national leader in moving quality forward. And I will point out to you the most important role that I think she's ever played, in my view, is that she was at one time director of quality in Medicaid and CHIP. Um, so please join me in welcoming Jean Moody Williams and enjoy the conference. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It is always such a pleasure for me to be here with you to introduce our theme for the next three days, to talk about it. As, as many of you know, I have a little bit of fun with it as well. But um, our, our theme is building partnerships and delivering results. So when I, when I think about building something and delivering something, it automatically kind of draws my attention to the construction business. And I think about building a house. And um, when we begin to think about building something, there are certain things that we do. And you see them on the slides there. We, we determine what type of house the customer wants. Uh, the value they're seeking, and, and we, exactly where do they want to live. We gather our materials and our tools, we assemble our construction crew, and then we prepare the site. Uh, we are building and pouring our foundation, completing the framing, we complete our final task, uh, put up the walls, the final fixtures, then we do a walkthrough to see how that goes. And then we see if any changes are necessary. Once we do that, we deliver the house to the customer. If this is what the customer requested, rarely do we deliver something else. <laughs> and, and tell them, you know, but this is better for you because this has the best technology and you can go to outer space in here. <laughs> you know, we, we just don't do that. So, you know, why would we do this in healthcare? When we think about building and these partnerships and relationships with one another, uh, some of the same principles apply. We look and determine what the customer wants and, and what, when we look at what they want to live. In healthcare, we don't always engage our customers to know what they want or what setting is it that they would prefer to receive their care. What is value? What does value mean to our, our patients and our families and our caregivers? So in building the house, we develop our plans, we gather our tools, uh, but in healthcare, our plans, our tools, they're not always understood. The evidence is not always clear or used when it's available. Uh, the tools are not always tested. Electronic health records are great, but not always interoperable. And we don't follow the plans and the guidelines. As a result, we have unwanted variation. I, I have uh, a special guest here with me today, uh, Ms. Dominique Friend and her husband, Michael Friend, who are sitting. Would, do you mind standing? Just stand for a moment and, and wave to the audience. <laughs> Dominique. Dominique has visited CMS on a couple of occasions. She's a patient and an advocate, and she has sickle cell disease, and she's given me permission to share this story. As she travels throughout the country, she travels in fear. She sees the variation in quality of care and never knows what to expect when she has a crisis and goes to an emergency department. While she hopes that the crisis can be prevented in the first place, there are times when she needs emergency care. She knows herself. She knows her condition. She knows what will help her survive the crisis. But often, the people don't stop to ask her or listen to her, and they automatically, on occasion, assume she's drug-seeking. She knows that she's going to be uh, treated differently depending on what door she walks into. She's fearful and waits with pain and suffering. She is asking us today to decrease the variation in care and work for equity for all patients. Thanks, Dominique. Thanks, Michael, for all you do. 
as you continue to build the house, you assemble your construction crew. Uh, some of the crew that we have have competing agendas. They're not necessarily willing partners. We prepare our site and start building and pouring the foundation, but sometimes our foundations have cracks, it's fragmented, we're siloed into different places. Um, and we don't always evaluate, monitor, and complete the PDSA cycles to do our walkthrough when we do our punch list. We don't always, we skip that step. So what happens is oftentimes we deliver something that the patient doesn't want. But I know, and I always say that this conference, I get excited. I was interviewed by someone who was writing a story about the conference, and they asked me, what's different about this conference? Well, the thing that's different is it truly is broad-based. All of the stakeholders come to work together for common good, better, smarter, healthier care. The conference uh, is results and action-oriented. We enable and share best practices. We learn from colleagues. We spread ideas. Our customers are in the room. It's the advocates, the patients, the representatives, the clinicians, the improvers. We are all in this room, and that is awesome. We've all come together. The leadership is committed, present, and accounted for. Within the, next, within the two hours that are passing here, you are hearing from the top leaders at CMS who have committed their time and resources to ensuring that quality is improved in this country. And we are here to break the mold and build and deliver results. Uh, Dennis talked about those things that will help us be successful in delivering results and building those partnerships. Uh, quite often in our day, and probably many times over the course of this conference, you're going to be asked to come together in partnership to come to consensus, to become a part of the group, to fit in, to be unified. And we ask you, and we're often asked to do this in our daily lives to live in peace and in harmony. While it may be our desire to do so, on occasion the ability to be unified as partners becomes a struggle. The root cause is often a misunderstanding of what it means to be partners and to be unified. Too often we believe it means to be the same, to do the same work, looking the same, thinking the same, acting the same. While that might be a nice thought, it is neither realistic exciting or desirable. True partnership and unity comes when our differences become our strengths, when our disagreements serve as windows into new ideas, and where our varying viewpoints become launching pads to new successes. This only happens when we understand that true partnership comes when we trust, we have a purpose, and we respect each other's challenges. There's much work to be done, some may seem competing, but we're smart people. There are smart people in this room. We can figure it out. We can take on the challenge of using opioids appropriately while still recognizing and treating sickle cell anemia as it should be. We can manage and treat sepsis while still being good stewards of antibiotics. We can use electronic health records while still looking our patients in the eye. We can figure this out. When I, when I respect you and trust you, we work together for a common purpose. It is difficult to undermine you, disregard your position, discredit your work, and recruit others to do likewise. But the best part of it all is when we operate in this sphere of trust, purpose, and respect, it's contagious. As we go out in action from this conference into our communities, our commitment and concern will be palpable by all we come in contact with. In fact, we can change a household, we can change a clinical practice, we can change a healthcare system, we can change a community, a nation, and indeed, we can change a world. I believe that, and I thank you for coming. And just as I leave, I know I'm going to get these questions. For those of you who have been coming to this conference for a while, I was asked by the interviewer, <laughs> um, 
uh, how long have you been coming to this conference? And I said, well, I don't really measure it in years. I measure it in events. Uh, the frequent followers of this conference have seen my children grow up, go to college, get married. No, I don't have any grandchildren yet. Uh, <laughs> the, the regular attendees at this conference have heard my journey with my mom as she suffered nearly every hospital-acquired condition you could think of, healthcare-acquired addition, because it was across the continuum of care until she uh, subsequently passed away. But some of you have said, well, I haven't, you never speak about your husband. You know, what's going on with that? <laughs> <laughs> So um, here's a picture of him. He's blessing his food, and he's praying that I never, ever speak about him at this conference. <laughs> but uh, he wishes you well and a happy, happy conference. Thank you. Thank you. And, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce Andy Slavic. And he asked for a short or no introduction. And I thought it, that, that's probably going to be easy because most of you already know he's the ultimate business professional, worked in the past for Goldman Sachs, McKinsey Company, and Optum, offering uh, the greatest in technology technological solutions. You may know that he's focused, has also, his focus has also been in consumer experience and access to care. But as the acting administrator of CMS, I wanted you to know that he is a tremendous leader. He's given us focus and direction, and he's moving us rapidly to a very different place in healthcare. He asks probing questions that make you think differently than you did when you walked into the room. He values people. Just yesterday, he took time out of a very, very busy schedule to meet with staff from the front line. And Andy, you'll never know how much that meant to all of those people that you met with yesterday. He's here because he wants to be and not because he has to be. So with that, please help me welcome our acting administrator, Andy Slavitt. Thank you, Gene. Who agrees with me that Gene is a national treasure? <laughs> Listening to you, I was inspired once again. I also want to say thanks to Vicki and Dennis. And I really want to thank all of you for being here and really participating in Quality Conference 2015. Let me begin by thanking you for your commitment to our beneficiaries. Anyone who's double-checked a patient's chart to reconcile a medication, who's made the extra phone call to make sure care transitions are happening appropriately, anyone who's had the courage to call attention to a defect in their own organization's safety and attempt to create a dialogue about it, anyone who's looked at the data of their own performance and look for opportunities to improve and change. Thank you. I know healthcare can be filled with plenty of distractions, but thanks to, for all you do to keep the patient at the center. I want to note as I begin that this conference aligns with one of the themes I'm going to touch on. By intentionally bringing together Medicare and Medicaid, the quality of these programs in one place I want you to take two meanings from this. First is an unequivocal commitment that there cannot be two standards of quality depending on how someone is covered. And second is our commitment to aligning the rules of how Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial programs work in the delivery system so we improve simplicity for those providing care. I came to D.C. and joined the men and women of CMS a year and a half ago after a fairly long career outside of government. Let me tell you what drew me to Washington, because I think it's a tough question to answer. <laughs> but at this point in time, what drew me to Washington from the private sector is that the health care agenda today is moving out of the talking about it stage to the changing it and getting it done stage. Probably like you, I've spent too many years and too many meetings 
talking about the stubborn uninsured rate and talking about the broken fee-for-service system, about consumerism that didn't really benefit the consumer, about what is quality without a commitment to the tools for quality improvement, about health IT that did nothing to improve health and wasn't the kind of IT that made people's jobs any easier. Healthcare doesn't present big opportunities for change very often. So let's commit to using our valuable time to move the needle. Over the last 50 years, from the onset of Medicare and Medicaid, as a country, we've steadily brought healthcare access and security to more people. From a time when half of seniors lacked access to basic coverage, programs such as Medicare and Medicaid, up through CHIP and prescription drug coverage, and more recently, the marketplaces, have dramatically reduced the uninsured rate and improved people's health. Low incomes, fixed incomes, uncertain incomes, and poor health status no longer keep people out of the care system. And we've seen generational reductions in poverty as a result. An equivalent opportunity for transformational change exists today with health care quality, and it can be tra traced to the Affordable Care Act and our commitment to better, smarter, safer, and higher quality health care system. With new patients entering the system, the mandate for quality in our nation has never been more important, and the goals never more pragmatic. Improve quality of life, reduce complications, manage chronic disease, and improve our ability to spend smarter in the process. But beyond the national level, every healthcare entity in America is now faced with the reality that thanks to Congress and the administration and the work of many of you in your organizations, measuring, improving, and delivering quality outcomes is a permanent part of how they will get paid. This is your platform. Take advantage of it. So how's it going? Very simply, it's beginning to work. Over the last few years, since the passage of the ACA, we've begun to make real progress. 95 out of 100 quality measures have increased across the country. And medical inflation over the same period is at historically low levels. And we've done it all while opening up access to care for over 16 million new people. And later today, the Department of Health and Human Services will release a report from AHRQ showing a 17% improvement in hospital-acquired conditions from 145 discharges, 145 per thousand discharges in 2010 to 121 in 2014. This means that from 2010 to 2014, an estimated 2.1 million fewer times was a patient harmed in America's hospitals. And an estimated 87,000 fewer patients died as a direct result of your successful improvement in quality. The major headline, the major headline is that it is safer today, far safer, for your or my loved ones who enters a hospital than it was just four years ago. Talk about transformational. But there's another headline that benefits all of us. And it's the effect quality improvement has on the sustainability of healthcare. Because this reduction in errors and complications has saved an estimated $20 billion in healthcare costs, or $5 billion annually. Think of this as a quality dividend that will allow us to sustain the healthcare system, one that measures one that takes care of people in their homes and other comfortable settings, that spends money more wisely through greater communication, consistency, and coordination, and builds a learning system that improves the fundamentals every day. We are no longer just talking about it. We are doing it. Now, all of this is both a collective success, but also a collective work in progress. We are just at the beginning of change. 
And I believe that the most important realization we can make today is that what we've done so far is not going to be enough, and even more of the same won't get us the results we need. As Gene outlined, much of our progress to date has come from a critical focus on some fundamentals, picking out critical areas to move the needle, focusing on areas within silos, and reinforcing progress with some basic incentives. But to move forward and continue to make progress requires more than improvement in the fundamentals, but it requires understanding and adjusting to a new set of fundamentals serving a more mobile patient, a more diverse patient, and through better use of information. From beginning to measure to maturing as an information industry. From improving quality events to collaborating around end-to-end -end patient experiences. From improving quality on average to improving it for everyone across the socioeconomic, racial, ethnic and geographic spectrum. These new fundamentals will make, take more accountability, more collaboration, more cultural commitment, and more leadership across our communities. So we need to get busy. Now CMS is prepared to be a partner in this change. We're committed to listening and learning about what works and what doesn't, and being transparent, clear, and consistent in our priorities. I hold a not-so-distant memory of being outside of government when I worked to try to decipher what sometimes felt like opaque or unpredictable policies and regulations. You shouldn't have to comb through regulations to piece together what we're saying. So one of my commitments and one of our commitments today is speaking to you straight about our agenda and equally straight about our expectations. Our priority is clear to drive a delivery system that provides better care, a smarter payment system, and that keeps people healthier. This means specifically that by 2018, we will reach a tipping point in our payments with over 50% of Medicare fee-for-service payments rewarding for quality and value and aligning Medicare Advantage and Medicaid to do the same. This commitment from us should help galvanize our organizations in the right directions, your organizations in the right direction. Change often boils down to practical decisions, where to invest. And we aim to make the case that investment in a quality program and population health will carry a greater return than another expensive MRI machine or another new wing on a hospital. Our commitment extends beyond how we pay to data, tools, and sharing best practices as we commit to providing leadership in data transparency and technical support. Payment policy is not our goal. Until we produce better care, more affordably, we will not have succeeded. I know of one hospital in Michigan for, as an example. It's an urban hospital who participates in our value-based purchasing program, which rewards for improvements in quality. Their first year in, they received a payment reduction. You can imagine how discouraging this was, let alone a threat to their viability. The next year, they focused on their clinical processes and fully improved and implemented an EMR. And the next year, they improved their quality score by 32 points. The incentive alone wasn't enough, but combining the tools of technology and different payment structure helped the leadership provide better care and get rewarded for it. And this is why we just committed to a $650 million plus investment for 140,000 physicians across the country to support them in their aim to transform their practices and get paid for quality. Now in the remainder of my time, let me call out three specific areas that we believe will be at the heart of making continued progress. Defining quality around the emerging needs of today's patient, Ensuring quality is equitably delivered to people with a diverse set of needs. And turning healthcare into an information industry that supports the patient and those who serve them. First is meeting the needs of a new and more mobile patient and their family. For us, this means refreshing our understanding 
of who our customer, the patient, is. At CMS, there are 140 million different beneficiaries and consumers who rely on CMS's programs every day. Who are they? It's the Medicare patient leaving the hospital with five prescriptions to fill and two appointments to book. The young marketplace customer who will have coverage for the first time and finally be able to have his wife's chronic fatigue treated. It's the daughter who's made the difficult decision to finally put her mother in a nursing home and wants the very best quality. It's the Medicaid patient waiting for her kidney transplant and man managing to make it to dialysis for most appointments. The cancer patient who's decided he wants to be treated at home and in more comfort. It's the family with a child with severe disabilities on Medicaid that requires 24-hour care and is watching every dollar and interviewing every home care worker. These are a diverse group of people with a diverse set of health care needs, affordability concerns, and each has their own definition of quality. This is a consumer who's more mobile and more demanding than ever before and is used to a life where information, choices, quality are improving at a rapid pace, just not in their health care life. For all the quality improvement we've achieved to date, for progress to continue, it must be felt by these millions of Americans and their families, the way they experience care and the way they think about quality. In a larger variety of care settings, with a broader array of care providers, with more transitions and opportunities for drop balls and miscommunication, and for millions of people with historic relationship, without historic relationships with the healthcare system, other than perhaps at an ER. Understanding and wrapping your quality practices around this mobile patient and their needs is critical. Until the consumer feels the improvement in quality, we haven't been successful. The second critical focus I want to talk about is in the area of health equities. We can't just improve average quality levels. We need to improve quality for everyone, but we, and we also need to close the gap between those at the top and those at the bottom, starting with where we are falling behind the most, including and in particular individuals with lower incomes, people with disabilities, racial and ethnic minorities, and those living in rural communities. We don't need a lot of data to tell us we have a problem here, but we do need data that helps us actively manage and measure our visibility. And we all understand that many barriers to care aren't clinical, they're social, economic, and the practical things in people's lives that don't match up to the way we built our delivery system. If patients are customers, we need to change our service model rather than expecting people to change their lives to come to us. Across Medicare and Medicaid, we have consistently high expectations for quality. And we're excited about the recent launch of our CMS equity plan and we at CMS are publicly and visibly focused on ensuring proper incentives for those in the communities who make investments in dual eligible and higher risk patients. We have conducted research and are accepting comments now in these areas for Medicare Advantage and through SIM grants, delivery system reform waivers and other activities, we're working to make quality delivery an equivalent expectation for beneficiaries in Medicaid. But more broadly, health equity goals are a critical component of new CMS requirements in many things we do, including the new QIO SOW and as part of MACRA. The focus on health equity is particularly important to all of us today with the advent and launch of new alternative payment models. To be very clear, cherry picking or redlining one's way to a quality bonus will not work. I am asking every health plan, hospital, physician practice to ensure that your contract language, your training materials, your data, and your everyday practices work to achieve health equity. There are a few, only a few things that will rate a phone call from me to a CEO, and this is one of them. Third, 
for continued progress to be possible, healthcare must become an information industry. Now, someone asked me recently, what is the opposite of an information industry? And I thought, probably it's an industry of best guesses. So CMS has begun a journey, beginning with how we release data, and we're extending it further. We now release over 200 new and updated data files on everything from geographic, variations in care, Medicare, to chronic disease patterns, to utilization and prescribing patterns, quality data on hospitals, on nursing homes, home health agencies, physicians, and dialysis facilities. And we are making the creation of usable information part of doing business with the federal government. We're requiring commercial health plans that do business in the marketplace and Medicare to make data that is valuable to providers and patients available in machine-readable form. We've led the development of a federated data infrastructure on a, for health plans, and we're building and investing in a Medicaid data infrastructure. We will use every opportunity to plant the seeds that permanently change data av availability and create a usable information pipeline for researchers and software developers. And we now provide data to providers on their population's claims experience in near real time as we get data from our claim systems. So how we provide data to enable change is of equal importance to CMS as how we pay for care. This is a big departure as we partner with consumers and healthcare, in the healthcare community. We're not just a payer, we're an information provider, and we are working every day to change our own culture. At this point, it's not technology, but business practices which hold us back from moving forward with data. Earlier this year, I visited a safety net clinic in Chicago with a great electronic medical record and analytics capability. They enjoy some of the highest quality results in the country. Only the physicians can't follow patients who see specialists outside of the clinic or who need inpatient care. Information must be able to move from point A to point B along with the patient. We continue to hear stories of those who intentionally block information from moving outside of their own systems. Very soon, all EMRs have to be required, will be required to have open APIs or access points so that innovators can build applications and safely and securely connect to the data in an EMR. But in the meantime, if you are experiencing or witnessing a practice that blocks information from moving, I would just ask you to send an email to well, an email box that's no information blocking at cms.hhs.gov. Because information blocking is not acceptable to patients or to us. People don't experience care in silos and their data can't live in silos. But none of this matters unless the data helps providers deliver patients better care. And so in addition to making data available and portable, we must make it usable by integrating it with the needs of providers. This is part of our larger commitment to the healthcare system, and maybe our most important, and that is to simplify. We believe the most valuable commodity physicians and other care providers have is their time. Time we would like them to spend productively with patients and their panels and away from the paperwork or systems that don't help them. CMS has a lot of work to do here and we need your help. We are making it a priority to reduce paperwork, align our quality measures, and roll back regulations that have outlived their usefulness. We're making reforms to Medicare regulations that are identified as unnecessary, obsolete, or excessively burdensome on hospitals and other care providers. To date, in fact, we've saved nearly $660 million annually or $3.2 billion over five years. We have more work to do here. This is just the beginning. So committing to quality is also about committing to change. To reach the next level, we will need to both continue what we're doing and do more to integrate around the mobile consumer and focusing especially on the needs of the most difficult to treat individuals so we don't leave them behind 
and support an infrastructure which provides more usable information to everyone. This is the most exciting time to be in healthcare. Your work is not only integral to charting the course for improving the life for Jesse Soriano and the patients he assists, but if we do it right, to building a system that can be around to serve his six children, his seven grandchildren, and his two great-grandchildren. The next step requires your innovation, all your capabilities, your focus and commitment to quality, and your willingness and ability to measure and be accountable like never before. I hope you enjoy the rest of this conference. We look forward to continuing our collaborative work to listening and learning and supporting the urgent and critical progress ahead. I now want to call up Dr. Patrick Conway, who is our Chief Medical Officer, Principal Deputy, and many and any other hat that he is asked to wear, not just for CMS, but as a partner to all of you. My good friend and partner, Patrick. That's great. Thanks, man. So uh, just want to thank Andy for being here. I will say uh, Andy uh, has just been uh, tremendous uh, to work with. And I think uh, Andy and the whole team at CMS, uh, really, as you know, trying to be helpful, drive positive change, a system that achieves uh, better care, smarter spending, and healthier people. And obviously, Andy being here today shows his commitment to this work. Uh, I'm going to hit a few uh, highlights, as always. I have slides that I'll go through way too fast, but we can, uh, we can share them uh, later. First, I want to, and hopefully I don't really just have five minutes, uh, but we'll see. Um, uh, first, I want to thank you for being here and the work that you do. I mean, it's ex so exciting to see over a thousand people, uh, you know, from states and communities across the country, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, private sector, driving change in various communities across the country. So I want to first thank you for the work that you do uh, on behalf of the American people, and you guys should give yourself a round of applause. Second, and we'll uh, hit on some of these results along the way, I think uh, in classic quality improvement fashion, you know, we've made significant progress and now the question is how do you accelerate that even faster? Uh, Don Berwick, my first boss uh, at CMS, at one point said to me, Patrick, you're doing a great job. Just go better and faster, uh, which is classic Don. Um, so uh, I think that is true. Uh, this is my fifth QualityNet conference. Uh, I am now actually the longest serving chief medical officer in CMS history. So I don't know what that says. I do know one thing it says. The other day, our communications director uh, said, you know, Patrick, you need a new picture. I was like, why do I need a new picture? She's like, okay, I'll be honest. You look a lot older than when you started. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay, thanks. Uh, went home to my wife. I said, they say I need a new picture. I don't need a new picture. My wife's like, yeah, you should get a new picture. <laughs> um, so the, the job is aging me. Um, so um, first, I want to put out a couple congratulations. One, uh, today CMS will announce a $110 million award in end-stage renal disease network funding for 18 ESRD networks to seven entities. So we're incredibly excited about the work that's gone on in this program and the work in the future. Um, ESRD patients, as you know, make up less than 1% of the population, but 7% uh, of the budget and opportunities for quality improvement. And then this is our second conference with Medicaid colleagues as well, so uh, really excited about this work. If you think about the fee-for-service payment system, you guys know this, There's excessive, there can be excessive use of low-value services, in a, in a, insufficient incentives to improve, and poor coordination of care. And if you think about the Affordable Care Act, really three main things. One, expansion of health insurance coverage. And we're now at the lowest uninsured rate in U.S. history, which is tremendously good news. And then I'll also talk about the delivery system reform work, which is generating uh, lower cost trends, smarter spending, and improved quality of care. This is just quality projections. If you go back to 2010 and CBO projections to today, over $200 billion in cost savings, and people saying it's fundamental shifts uh, in the delivery system that are a large contributing factor to this. Um, 
this is our, our frame for delivery system reform, better care, smarter spending, healthier people. We do think incentives matter in terms of alternative payment models and value-based purchasing, care delivery, uh, and much of this is the work that you lead. So how do you, fo how do you foster quality improvement? How do you integrate mental and behavioral health with traditional medical care? You know, how do you enable telehealth and other new uh, solutions and just met uh, um, uh, with Project ECHO uh, leadership this morning discussing this uh, into the care delivery system. And then uh, information. So how do you create transparency on quality and cost information and get the right information at the point of care? Yeah, our goals for payment reform, these were announced by the President and Secretary Burwell uh, earlier this year. 30% of payments and alternative payment models where the provider is accountable for quality and total cost of care by the end of 2016, 50% by the end of 2018. Uh, we are uh, confident that we are on target to meet that 2016 goal. And then 85% of payments uh, with a link to quality and, and cost uh, by the end of 2016, 90% by the end of 2018. Once again, confident we'll reach that 2016 goal. And then importantly, uh, launching networks, really learning from work we did in the QIO program uh, early on about uh, collaborative networks with the private and public sector on how we drive positive change. Uh, this just graphically shows where we were in payment and where we are now. You know, 2011, um, we had 0% in Medicare and alternative payment models. By the end of 2014, we were at 20%, and that number continues to grow. This is important because the quality improvement and safety work that you do, it increasingly becomes the norm. So clinicians and care teams are actively thinking about care coordination, uh, eliminating patient harm, you know, really engaging with the patient in a deep way every day, and it's also financially supported in our healthcare system. Um, this is a paper from Harlan Krumholtz, uh, and I think the QIO program and the quality improvement work that you do is a major factor behind these results. And Harlan, who's a hardcore health services researcher and almost never says the word jaw-dropping, in the New York Times called this jaw-dropping results for the Medicare program. So. 1999 to 2013, uh, as the, the population ages, more chronic conditions, significant reduction in all-cause mortality, which is approximately 300,000 less people dying each year. Uh, significant reductions, which QIO program was a major factor in, uh, in hospitalizations at a population level. So 3 million beneficiaries staying home and healthy instead of being hospitalized every year. And then you can see reductions in inpatient expenditures and hospitalizations at the end of life as well. Uh, this, this is a picture of two of our now four kids. I hadn't, Danielle inserted this. She was like, um, and I'll get to this at the end, but we're making a transition in CCSQ, which I will tell you about. But she said, you need to show your family one last time. So this is two of our four kids a while ago now. Uh, you know, yesterday in one of my meetings on the Hill, I was like Jack, very frustrated and slightly angry. Um, I'll be honest. Um, but I, I listened well as I was being yelled at. Um, and then, uh, you know, but most of the time I'm like Savannah. I just did uh, an interview uh, that I read last night. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm the quality and safety work, which is the core of this conference, I mean, that is my core. It's, you know, what I've been focused on for uh, 20 plus years now. Um, and I really think, um, you know, most days, and Jack is a wonderful child too, by the way. I don't, this is not a comment on my children. Uh, but, uh, you know, most days very much like Savannah. So to celebrate some of our successes, you know, won't go through all these, but care transitions work, and this is work the QIO program led, you know, a billion dollars in cost savings. Reducing uh, healthcare acquired conditions, over 85,000 and growing, 53% reduction. You know, reducing adverse events, you can see 44,000 plus. Uh, the nursing home work, reducing pressure ulcers, um, uh, antipsychotic use uh, in the nursing homes. I mean, just, you know, collaborative work engaging, you know, thousands of nursing homes. So just really exciting across the board work. I will say, you know, we got to keep going faster. We got to just keep pushing on these results because at the end of the day, you know, these are our loved ones that are in hospitals or nursing homes or other settings and we would want the best possible care for them. 
Um, I still practice on weekends as a physician, and I still unfortunately see where we have system failures. And it's not people, it's systems and care teams and the work that you uh, support. Um, ESRD network success, as you can see, um, uh, you know, the patient and family engagement work, we've really been leaders in that work. Reduction in long-term catheter use of 11%. The vaccination results, you know, increasing vaccination, 240% for Hep B, you know, 300 plus percent uh, for PPV, and then you can see disparity reductions and successful peer-to-peer -peer initiative work. Um, this is your national Quinn QIO recruitment. You don't have to read the details of this slide, but you know, over 11 million beneficiaries and growing that you're touching through your work and improving uh, the care delivered. I know we have patients and families in the audience, uh, which is why uh, we do this work. You know, over 3,000 hospitals, so the majority of hospitals. You know, over 8,000 nursing homes, so now the majority of nursing homes in this country. You know, heading towards 3,000 home health agencies. So the scope of your work, which I think we all collectively, you know, need to continue to communicate, uh, is incredibly large and impactful. And once again, the question is, you know, how do we grow this group? scope both in terms of providers we're working with and also the impact on those providers that we're working with and ultimately the impact uh, and the most critical outcome, the impact on patients and families in a positive way. You know, these are the safety results which um, uh, Andy uh, mentioned and are uh, coming out today. Uh, so the good news at the bottom of the slide, if you look 2010 to 2014 and you know this is the work of you know you in this room plus thousands of people across the U.S. So CMS helped catalyze this work, but we cannot take credit. This is really a credit to you and so many other people in the field. 2.1 million fewer infections and adverse events. Yeah, over 2 million people. Uh, almost uh, $20 billion in cost savings and 87,000 fewer uh, deaths related to infections and adverse events. And I do, I think you guys should give yourself a round of applause for that as well. <laughs> I, I will say, I, you know, as you can see, uh, you know, our next challenge is 121 is still too much. You know, we need it to go lower. We, uh, you know, the goal should be ultimately get to cl as close to zero as possible. So our collective challenge is how do we continue to accelerate uh, the pace of this improvement I'm going to fly through some of these slides. You know, the Innovation Center, here's the whole portfolio. Not going to go through the whole portfolio today. A couple that I did want to mention, our Pioneer ACO uh, model was the first one to be certified by the actuary, which is a high bar, improves quality, lowers cost. And then our uh, joint replacement model, uh, you know, we're paying for joint replacement now. We finalized a rule 90-day episode with quality measures uh, and cost measures. You know, I will tell one story here, which is just uh, about the culture change. I have a good friend, Academic Medical Center CEO, uh, about three years ago, had lunch with him. He said, you know, love what you're doing, Patrick, great work. Got to tell you, I'll never be in any of these models. You know, I've been a CEO 20 years, large academic center, charge whatever I want. Fee-for-service has been good to me. Uh, it was a very honest conversation. Um, uh, you know, several months ago now, I had lunch with him. He's like, man, I got to tell you. This is moving fast. You, you're moving faster than I thought. That was point number one. Point number two, my private payers are moving in the same direction. I went to negotiate this year, and they said, no, you can't just raise the rates. You've got to go into some kind of ACO contract, and that's what it is. Uh, third, and I think this is the critical point, his physicians and clinician leaders started coming to him and saying, what is wrong with us? How are we not in a bundled payment model? How are we not in an ACO model? How are we not focused on patient safety, quality improvement, you know, training the next generation of leaders, which shifted him. They are now in multiple of our models. They're participating in our quality improvement results. And I think it's a story about the culture change uh, that we're trying to drive. Comprehensive primary care, just briefly, you know, I think this model could be uh, the future of primary care in the U.S. We continue to learn and build, but uh, put all putting in population-based payments to primary care, 13 aligned quality measures with private payers, uh, all focused on reducing total cost of care. We spend less than 7% in the U.S. on primary care services, but they obviously control a large portion of spend. SAMA Healthcare, 
one of the people in this model. Um, they redesigned their practice, invested in care teams. They've got now teams that have a, a, a nurse practitioner, a care manager, have pharmacy and social work support, using their EHR to triage patients, using telehealth to monitor patients remotely. Their lead physician said a few key things that I think are relevant to your work and our work. Number one, he said, I'm finally practicing medicine the way I want to. After 30 years, I'm finally practicing the way I want to. Number two, his patients love it. They have no idea they're an innovation center model or why people visit them in the nursing homes now and call them about their medications and help them with their social supports, but they love it. And number three, we put about a million dollars, all payers in this practice year one total. They decreased total cost of care over three million. You know, he made the point, I never could have done it. I would have mortgaged my house five times over in Arkansas. I'm a small business. So I think this tells you what we can do when we get the right technical supports in place plus the right payment incentives. State innovation broadly, uh, and we do push them to continue to work with the QIO program and all the various uh, quality improvement supports in states. You know, 38 states testing or designing their changes at the state level. You know, things like Arkansas with bundled payment for you know, pre-birth to one year postnatal for a mother and child. Um, Maryland, maybe one of the most innovative, you know, moved to a population-based payment model where, as you can see, um, over 90% of the revenue becomes from population-based payments, meaning not fee-for-service payments. Now the way you're successful in Maryland is you keep people healthy and out of the hospital. That is directly how you're financially successful and, by the way, the right thing to do for patients. Um, over $100 million in cost savings in the first year and significant improvements in quality. So I think, once again, shows if we get the incentives right and we focus on how to improve, we can dr improve dramatic uh, improvements at a population level. You know, what are we focused on? We're focusing on implementing these models, being a continuously learning organization, including lean and some of the other work that we're uh, uh, putting internally so we can improve ourselves just like we ask others to improve. You know, the road ahead has numerous uh, programs, et cetera, uh, that will be uh, coming and you'll hear more about these throughout the Congress. You know, we, you know this, we can't do it alone. We need every single person in this room uh, working together plus all the people you connect with. You know, we need a network of people in states, communities, provider organizations driving towards quality improvement uh, and better results. Um, you know, as always, focus on eliminating patient harm, focus on better care, smarter spending, and healthier people. Uh, really invest in the quality infrastructure necessary to improve. So internally in the federal government, I can tell you our team is always focused on convincing our colleagues that the investment in the quality infrastructure is critically important. Um, last couple slides here. Um, you know, keep asking yourselves a few questions. What would you do if, what would you, do if you knew you could not fail? Uh, number two, how will it help the patient? So always and always focused on patients and families first. And then number three, how can you help foster a health system that achieves better care, smarter spending, and healthier people? You know, I believe, and I've said this publicly, that we've seen more improvement in our health system in the last five years than I've ever seen before. I also think if we don't at least keep that pace of improvement and most likely accelerate that pace of improvement, our health system will not achieve what it needs to for the American people. Um, so uh, this is the last slide here. We did not come here to fear the future. We came here to shape it. Uh, on that note, uh, we do have a transition in the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality. Um, the good news is um, we have a, a great uh, new leader of CCSQ, Kate Goodrich, who many of you may know and will come speak next. In addition, you still have an incredibly strong CCSQ team from Jean Moody Williams to Debbie Hattery to Sherry and uh, Dennis and Paul and Janine and I can't name everyone, Danielle, et cetera, uh, but an amazing uh, team across CCSQ. It's now almost 500 people, so it's impossible to name everyone. Um, and when I made them do Facebook pictures so I could memorize their faces, people thought that was weird and didn't really like it, so I didn't do it again. Um, <laughs> Danielle's laughing, true story. Um, so anyway, I want to end where I started. Um, the work you do is critically important to patients and families, so I want to thank you for that, and collectively let's work together to continue to accelerate the positive results. Thanks a lot for your time.
Hello, everybody. It is so nice to be with you here today. This is, I think, my third uh, quality conference, but first one in this new role. Um, I want to thank Patrick uh, and Andy for giving me the opportunity to uh, lead CCSQ. Um, I am incredibly grateful for this opportunity, and I also want to emphasize what Patrick said. We have an amazing leadership team within CCSQ, and coming from being director of the Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group, or QuimVig, as you all know, um, into the front office at CCSQ really felt very comfortable to me. It really felt like home. And that's because I've worked for a long time with these incredible leaders that are now my partners um, in the work in CCSQ. So I've worked for a long time with Gene Moody Williams on the development and implementation of the quality strategy, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, I worked uh, for quite a while, three years, with Debbie Hattery, uh, standing up and implementing all of our quality and value-based purchasing programs. And of course, Sherry has uh, been an amazing uh, partner, working to ensure that we always hear, adhere to the highest standards of evidence in all the work that we do, whether it's related to our coverage decisions or to our quality measurement. So a, just a little bit of background about me. As you know, I've been in the Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group for three years, standing up a number or implementing and continuing a number of quality public reporting value-based purchasing programs, the Meaningful Use Program, the Marketplace Quality Work. So I have you know, about a four-year history, almost five-year history now as a policymaker. I also am a practicing physician like Patrick. I see patients uh, in a hospital on the weekends and spent about 13 years at an academic medical center. So definitely bring that perspective uh, to the work that I do now. And then finally, I think the most important perspective that I have that I am certain that I share with many of you here is that of a caregiver. I've cared for my mother uh, for the past several years. She lives with me. It's been a privilege and an honor to be so close to her uh, physically, uh, have her, her with me at, at all times, uh, you know, as she's in, entering into her eighth and ninth decades of life. Uh, and, and of course, that brings a whole different perspective. And I know that's one that you all share. Jean's talked uh, many years about the care of her mother um, as well. And I think that that really underpins the passion for the work that we do. So I want to talk to you a little bit about our vision for CCSQ. As Andy said, it's an incredibly exciting time to be at CMS and an incredibly exciting time to be in CCSQ. In addition to playing just a major role in the agency's delivery system reform goals, we really are in an action or implementation phase of our work. We're no longer in the talking about it stage, as Andy put it. I thought that was a great way to put it. We're in the changing it and doing it uh, phase. All of the good strategic thinking and planning around how to transform the healthcare system of the last several years by folks at CMS, HHS, Congress, many of our stakeholders, is now coming to life. It's either being implemented, we're working with you to implement it, or we are planning for it. And so I can't possibly name all of the things that we're doing in CCSQ, but I do want to highlight a few things. First of all is um, standing up the, the macro legislation, so the new merit-based incentive payment system for physicians and the transition for physicians and other clinicians into alternative payment models. This is the biggest change in clinician payment in many, many years. We really see standing up the new MIPS program as the foundation for getting providers ready for alternative payment models. And with that, comes the largest investment in technical assistance to frontline clinicians with the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, our PTNs and SANS who are here with us this year, additional work for the Quinn's QIOs, as well as technical assistance for small and rural practices that the macro legislation provided. And so I sort of see this as being parallel to what we did when the ACA passed and we had the new hospital value-based purchasing program and the hospital readmission reductions program and the HACC program. So we had new value-based purchasing programs and we launched the partnership for patients as well as additional work for the Quinn QIOs to help hospitals succeed in the context of those programs. That's what we're doing here as well uh, with TCPI and the other programs I mentioned. How many of you are familiar with the IMPACT Act? Show of hands. Okay, a few of you, but not enough of you. This is one of the greatest things ever. I have to tell you about the Impact Act. It's one of our, it's one of our main priorities in CCSQ. What the Impact Act does is it requires that we implement uniform, standardized data elements into the healthcare assessments that we currently require for post-acute care settings. Care data set for the long-term care, 
the, for the rehab facilities, the IRF PI or patient assessment instrument, OASIS for home health, and the minimum data set for nursing homes. This means that for the first time that we'll be measuring patients' functional status, cognitive status, falls, pressure ulcers, discharge to community, readmissions, resource use in the same way across all settings. And it also requires that these data be interoperable so that the data actually follow the patient across settings. Imagine that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're so excited about this, it doesn't show. Uh, so ultimately, this is gonna allow cross-setting quality comparison of all those domains that I mentioned, which will provide insight into which post-acute care setting is best for which type of patient. That's something we really don't have a lot of insight into right now, but we're gonna have that. And importantly, this act conveys the inclusion of patient-centeredness into its requirements related to capturing patient preferences and goals. It's in the law, it's pretty amazing. In our coverage and analysis group, we hope to build upon our positive experience with parallel review with the FDA and continue to work uh, through coverage determinations and use of coverage with evidence development when we don't have enough evidence to know what is best and safest for our Medicare beneficiaries. And then finally, our clinical standards and survey and certification teams have been working incredibly hard over the last couple of years on implementation and modernization of the health and safety standards for multiple settings and topics for hospitals, home health agencies, long-term care, discharge planning, all while focusing on reduction of burden along the way. Now what ties all of this work together, of course, is the CMS quality strategy. You all first heard us talk about this two years ago. I have to say, this is one of the most rewarding experiences that I had as the director of the quality measurement group. Um, I partnered with Jean and many other folks across the agency in the development of the strategy. And so I want to tell you a little bit about where we are today with the strategy and of course to thank all of you for the hard work that you've been doing over the last two years to implement the strategy and get the results that we've just heard about. So we released the strategy first in 2013, actually at this conference. And we talked about how it was intended to be a living document, not just a plan that sat on a shelf. I was told by the chief operating officer of CMS at the time that she could identify seven quality strategies that sat on the shelf from her time at CMS. Uh, but this one has definitely not done that. And of course, I believe it was last year that we uh, played for you uh, a very exciting video, the Jeopardy video, with some of the loveliest uh, employees of CMS in that video. We don't have anything quite so exciting this year. Uh, but we do have a whole session on the quality strategy that we want to invite you to. We have really worked hard to try to embed the quality strategy in our day-to-day -day work. You all, of course, know extremely well um, how the strategy has been uh, described and pointed to throughout the statements of work that many of you have responded to uh, through many of our other contracts as well. Uh, the quality strategy is embedded into our CMS staff and leadership performance evaluations. And of course, we create expectations for the folks that we work with uh, to execute on the strategy. There is a session tomorrow I want to highlight at 3 p.m. on the quality strategy being led by Maria Durham uh, from CCSQ. We want to hear from you about how you have implemented the strategy in your work as well. Another key way that we have implemented the strategy at CMS is through the development of what we call affinity groups. In fact, the first affinity group was the group that developed the CMS quality strategy. And these affinity groups are um, composed of people from across the entire agency who have a passion for a topic that they're working on, and they want to collaborate with colleagues to ensure that we're coordinated in all of our efforts across CMS. So some of the groups to highlight for you, I think we have, I want to say we have nine or 10 now, I forget how many, we have a lot. Uh, but some of the ones that have been really active and have already shown some results are, of course, the quality strategy group. We have a value-based purchasing group that has um, identified principles around value-based purchasing programs and how we actually uh, compare cost and quality. We have a person and family engagement group read, led by Janina Wugo, who is here today. Um, who then uh, their strategy is um, hopefully going to be available soon, going through clearance, I believe. And we have a nursing home convergence group, as well as behavioral health and population health. And I think what's important here is, this, you know, while these are CMS affinity groups, we've invited a number of partners from across the entire Department of Health and Human Services, as well as external partners, in order to build partnerships with this work. And that building partnerships is going to be a theme uh, that I'll come back to as well. A key part of the quality strategy, though, is that we have to hold ourselves accountable and to measure and deliver results. And really serious progress has been made to date. You've already heard about the amazing safety results. I won't repeat those, but uh, those are, I think, some of our most amazing results to date. 
Our delivery system reform goals that Patrick and Andy both talked about, getting to where half of payments from the Medicare fee-for-service system, as well as we think our commercial payers and state partners, are through alternative payment models, and that the vast majority of our payments are tied to quality. Those are clear results that we're working towards as well, and we think they're well within reach. And of course, 95% of our quality measures, many of which we use to track progress on the quality strategy, have improved. So one of the big themes of this conference is that we really want to be focused on results. And by results, I mean measuring and improving on patient outcomes, reduced harm events, lowering costs, and improve experience for patients and families. We must be driven by results in order to continuously improve. And we have a number of tactics for delivering results. Innovation, being data-driven, focusing at the person at the center of our work, and really importantly, collaboration and sharing knowledge of what works. And so this is one of my most important messages for you today, is that we really must collectively focus on building partnerships and collaboration with one another and others on the front lines and sharing knowledge about what works. We have proven that we can get results for patients and families if we forge partnerships and if we understand our data and use our data. Our default should always be to collaborate. When you have an idea for a new project, when you have a question about something, your default should be to find partners to help you answer the questions or help you execute on your idea. My personal commitment to you is to work across and outside of CMS to model the behavior that we seek. I can't expect you all to collaborate, share knowledge, and be results driven if I'm not doing the same thing. So we expect that identifying opportunities for synergy and alignment, as well as strategies to mitigate any potential duplication of effort, should be developed between the experts and the organizations who perform the work. So for example, we expect that decisions should be made collaboratively between the hospital engagement networks and the Quinn QIOs so that both can realize the benefits of partnership and sustainability of results for reducing harm and readmissions. I also strongly encourage our participants here and all the different networks that are here today, the Quinn QIOs, the hospital engagement networks, the practice transformation networks, support and alignment networks, our Medicaid state leaders and our, our ESRD networks, to team across networks, perhaps in ways that may not immediately seem as natural. So I had the privilege just last month of visiting one of the Quinns and ESRD networks in New York with a team from uh, CMS and HHS where I heard incredibly compelling and inspiring stories from patients about how their participation on their patient advisory council had made such an impact on their lives and the lives of others. I also heard in the same room, in the same conversation, nephrologists talking about how working with their patient advocates on this council had been transformative in their ability to improve care for all patients. And so with that, I see no reason why our colleagues here in the audience today who are part of uh, practice transformation networks or support and alignment networks can't partner with those in the ESRD networks who have had a tremendous success working with patient advisory councils and should learn from what has worked and maybe what hasn't worked so well. So again, we must be inclusive of all partners, patients, advocates, providers, frontline workers, we're all in this together. And finally, it's important to acknowledge that transformation of our healthcare system is leadership work. All of you in this room are leaders for this country in improving the quality of care for patients and families. And so in this role, we expect a few things of you. We expect you to set bold aims that are beyond your immediate reach and to achieve these aims by enrolling others in the work and partnering with one another and with other stakeholders who may not be here today. And that you enroll others in this work by making very specific requests and offers and that you secure commitments from each other to work together in specific ways that will generate results. I know you're hearing a lot of the same messages today. Um, I wasn't able to be here for uh, Dennis's talk early this morning, but I know this is something that, that he and others who work with all of the different networks feel very strongly about, and I want you to know that I do as well, and that our expectation of all of you as leaders is that you leave the Quality Conference with commitments that support generating results. And so finally, I just want to thank you again for being here today and for the work that you do. Um, you've already made such a tremendous impact on this country that goes beyond, I believe, just Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, and again, just so excited to be here and looking forward to spending some time with all of you over the next three days. And now I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dennis Wagner, I believe. Thank you so much.
Um, I think we've heard a lot from a lot of really extraordinary national leaders. You're in for a treat. We've got a wonderful speaker, Dr. Sanjeev Arora, who's going to be our, our, our next guest. And I am excited to introduce Dr. Arora to you. But before I do that, I think we need to just take a minute or two, stand up, take a stretch break, just stand up, don't leave. <laughs> and I want to invite you to discuss your answer to a question with the person you're sitting next to. What excites you the most about what you heard this morning? Take two minutes, discuss, go. Okay, if I could have you come back to the full room, to the community of the whole, take your seats. Thank you. It's a lot of energy in this room. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. So thank you for that. You know, when you hear that much powerful information, results, celebrations, requests, possibilities, opportunities, you kind of, you get a little pent up, you know, you, you get a lot of energy inside. It's kind of good to release it and kind of share some of that with others. Now, we're going to collect just a couple answers. It might be an answer you gave or it might be an answer you heard. And we've got a couple of mic runners. We have Mike over here, actually. Mike is your name. <laughs> Isn't that great? So our mic runner, Mike, over here. We have a couple others in the room. If you could hold them up high so people can see you we have right here. Um, very good. Uh, I think we may have one other. Who's willing uh, in the back? Yeah. So who's willing to either share an answer that you heard or give your answer? Oh, gentlemen, right here in the front. Right here. Good. And tell us who you are. Good morning. I don't know. It might be me. Good morning. My name is Stephen Coffey. From the MedStar, Georgetown. Feedback. So one of the things that excites me the most about what I'm seeing here today is the synergy from our senior leaders and the commitment that everyone has to making this work. Yeah. So it's one thing to talk about what we're going to do, but to actually see senior engagement and see the commitment by everyone here is something that's very encouraging for me, and certainly as a caretaker for my son who had a transplant at eight weeks old, to see the, the 
progress he's made from 2012 to now. And so that fits into the graph, the model we saw of uh, degrading the number of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, degrading the number of um, medical errors from 2010 to 2014. This is exciting to see this kind of commitment from this number. Beautiful. Thank you. Good. So we have someone right here in the back of the room. Tell us who you are. Dennis, Lisa Weiss, how are you? Um, I just wanted to say some of the conversation back here was um, an incredible amount of appreciation for the recognition of some of the legwork that the QIO industry has done um, in pushing forward your quality improvement agenda. And also a real thank you to you is recognizing that QIOs can serve as conveners to bring together all the groups to avoid duplication and help drive change together. So thank you for those. Excellent. <laughs> together we, we achieve more. We have one right here. You're going to be our last commenter. Tell us who you are. And I started dialysis in 1966. So I'm here to tell you that I want to give you hope so you can pass it on to the patients. And I want changes in dialysis because I had better dialysis than they do today. And that's why I'm still alive doing <laughs> squats when I'm 68. <laughs> All right. Now, we're not big into long introductions at the Quality Conference, but I have to say a few words about our next speaker. I met this gentleman earlier this year in Santa Fe, New Mexico, at a meeting that was convened by Health Insight, one of our QIOs, and I was blown away by what I, by what I heard from this man. I'm going to tell you a little bit about his credentials, but then I want to end with what really just absolutely astonished me about his work. So. Dr. Sanjeev Arora is a medical doctor and the director and founder of what's called Project ECHO. You see it described on the screen here, Extension for Community Health Outcomes. Now, this model was developed as an innov innovative way to expand access to specialty medical care for vulnerable populations in underserved areas. Dr. Arora was first initially very concerned about deadly hepatitis in New Mexico and thousands of people who couldn't possibly get the treatment they needed given the number of specialists that were available to provide it. And a lot of these folks were in prison and had no hope of getting the care. And he went to work on providing specialty care to that population. That's what's called Project ECHO, the methodology that he used to do this work. You'll hear more about it. It uses innovative video confer conferencing technology integrated with clinical management tools. It builds capacity among caregivers, nurses, primary care doctors, and others to provide the specialty care. It's really quite extraordinary. So here's what blew me away about Dr. Aurora. One was I encountered this caregiver who was humble and was deeply committed to seeing that the people who needed the care got it. But he couples that with a boldness that I find breathtaking and that I think all of us can learn from. CMS and the department have set bold aims for the work that we're doing and we're achieving some of those aims like the 40% reduction in preventable hospital harm was just one example talked about this morning. We've got other bold aims teed up. Dr. Aurora and his team have spread this model nationally out of New Mexico, and they've spread it internationally throughout the world. Their goal is to help improve the health of over a billion people. Isn't that extraordinary? Some of his awards, Teresa Hines and Hines Family Foundation 19th Hines Award for Public Policy, American College of Physicians and the American Telemedicine Association President's Award, was also recognized during World Hepatitis Day 2014 at the White House in Washington, D.C., and as a leader in advancing efforts to address viral hepatitis and the goals of the action plan for the prevention, care, and treatment of viral hepatitis. The one sentence Dr. Aurora said I could share was that his mission at ECHO is to transform healthcare for underserved patients all over the world 
by democratizing knowledge and bringing the right knowledge to the right place at the right time. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sanjeev Aurora. Thank you, Dennis, for this very kind and generous introduction. <coughs> I'm very grateful to you for this opportunity to speak to the audience here. At ECHO, our mission is to democratize medical knowledge and get best practice care to underserved people all over the world with the goal to touch the lives of one billion people by 2025. We're supported by the Department of Health in New Mexico, the federal government, CMMI, New Mexico legislature, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, GE Foundation, Helmsley Trust. <laughs> the key strategy to reach a billion people is to move knowledge instead of moving patients. We started this project in 2003 to tackle one healthcare problem, hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is a global health problem with 170 million people in the world who are infected. People die from this disease, from liver cancers, liver failure, end-stage liver disease. It's the number one reason why people get liver transplants in the world today. If current rates of treatment continue, 40 million people will die from this disease in the world. Only 0.5%, less than 1% of people in the world have been cured of this disease, even, if it's, even though it's curable. So in New Mexico, where I live, in 2004, 28,000 patients had been diagnosed. We knew their names because this is a reportable disease that essentially, every time a patient gets diagnosed, an electronic signal goes to the Department of Health with the name and every information about the patient. Yet, less than 5% of these people had been treated. We also knew the names of 2,300 prisoners who had it, and none, not a single one of them, had ever been treated. So I'm a liver specialist and a gastroenterologist, and I was treating hepatitis C at the University of New Mexico. I had this clinic for hepatitis C, and there was an eight-month wait to see me. People were basically coming hundreds of miles from Silver City, New Mexico, making 12 to 18 trips while they were getting this very toxic treatment with interferon and ribavirin, which is a chemotherapy-like regimen. They were getting this treatment, having all these side effects, and there was just no way, if they were poor, they could make 12 trips 200 miles each way. And of course, with an eight-month wait to see me, treatment was delayed. What became particularly frustrating for me was that patients started coming to see me when they already had liver cancers, and there's nothing I could do. Liver cancer is fatal almost 100% of the time. And I knew that we had a treatment. The disease was curable if I could get this chemo-like regimen. But my capacity to treat at the University of New Mexico was only 150 patients a year. So what was the problem? This treatment had very serious side effects, anemia, neutropenia, depression. And that not a single primary care doctor in New Mexico was treating this. And there were very few specialists who were available for these patients in rural areas. So we developed, in New Mexico, some of you may know New Mexico, 32 of 33 counties are medically underserved, 14 are health professional shortage areas, 19% poverty rate. So this was the challenge. And we developed Project ECHO in response to this challenge with two goals. We said, first, we would develop the capacity to safely and effectively treat hepatitis C everywhere in New Mexico. And second, we knew that if we could do this, we would have a model to treat complex diseases in rural locations and developing countries. ECHO is a collaborative model, and we develop partnerships partnerships between the university, the prisons, health department, Indian Health Service, federally qualified health centers, and the primary care association. If you have to remember just one slide from this presentation, this is the one to remember. There are four key principles on which Project ECHO is based. The first is to use technology to leverage the expertise of a multidisciplinary team of experts. In this case, it was a liver specialist, a psychiatrist, and a pharmacist. 
So the challenge was, how do you get all three people's expertise to reflect on a patient in a rural area? This is hard to do even in a city, let alone in a rural area. And technology can be an enabler to do that. The second key idea in Project Echo is to share best practices. I certainly don't want to talk about best practices too much to this audience, because you are the custodians of best practice and experts in this area. And Edward Deming described these ideas many, many decades ago. And we know that best practice dissemination has been extraordinarily successful in industry. I constantly hear the word Six Sigma, less than one defect in a million, when applied to many industrial processes and manufacturing processes. And often, what they use in best practices are algorithms. So in hepatitis C, an algorithm is essentially, for genotype 1, we used to treat for a year, for genotype 2, for six months. We need checklists that when a patient comes to see me for a 12-week visit while they were getting interferon and ribavirin, I had to do 16 different things. And if I tried to do these 16 things by memory, the quality would suffer. Because I was seeing patients every 15, 20 minutes, and I have to do 16 things. And so I needed a checklist. And then there was the need for the process, in that I couldn't do all 16 things myself. I had to know what was the role of the medical assistant, the role of the nurse, the role of a doctor, so that when all of this came together, that would create best practice. This is what industry uses. That's how you know, Toyota paints their car. And they need algorithm checklists, processes. And manufacturing can create this enormous quality. But one of the challenges in healthcare is, as opposed to industry, is we have a lot of input variation. And input variation in terms of every patient is different by age, by sex by body weight. Some are rich, some are poor, some are educated, some are not. Some have a car, some don't have a car. They don't know how to get to work at the doctor's office. Some have these social support systems. Some have cognitive skills that they can adhere to your complex treatments. Others are not educated. They don't understand how to follow all the instructions. Some are 80 years old and have eight different disease areas, and others are 20-year-old healthy people who can clearly follow instructions. So all of this creates complexity beyond imagination. So in addition to what industry uses for manufacturing, in healthcare, you need one other major ingredient. You need wisdom of experts who actually take this best practice and modify it for each individual patient. Now, of course, that creates a scaling challenge beyond imagination, where every patient with the same disease needs a slightly different course or uh, strategy. So if one has to say what is the one main contribution that ECHO makes to the world of healthcare quality, I would say it's a mechanism to scale the wisdom of a multidisciplinary team. So the second core principle in Project ECHO is to share best practices. So what we did was we created 21 centers of excellence for treating hepatitis C everywhere in New Mexico. 16 of them were in federally qualified health centers, and five were in the prison system. Remember, nobody had been treated there. Now, we didn't have do enough doctors, so most of these centers of excellence were run by nurse practitioners or physician assistants. And in about 40% of the situations, there was a family physician who ran these centers of excellence. That created the third key idea of ECHO, is how are we going to take a nurse practitioner or a family physician who had never done a fellowship or training in hepatitis C treatment or in gastroenterology, how are we going to make them as expert as a multidisciplinary team at the university? So we said we would use the same model how I became an expert. When I was doing my fellowship, I would see a patient. I would present the patient to my professor. They would help me manage this patient. I'd see another one, again present the patient. This process of iterative guided practice converted me from a novice to an expert. So we said we would use exactly the same method to actually create expertise in these rural communities and prisons. 
And then we would use a web-based database to monitor outcomes. So what do we do? We train these physicians, nurses, in best practices. We train them to use our web-based software to track patient outcomes. And then we conduct these teleecho clinics called knowledge networks. This is what a knowledge network looks like. In the big box is the University of New Mexico, a liver specialist, a psychiatrist, and a pharmacist. In the small box on the top right is Deb Newman from Espanola. She's presenting a patient of hepatitis C to us. I need about 15 pieces of information. She gives me all 15 in about five minutes, always in the same sequence, and we help her. The psychiatrist help her, helps her, the pharmacist helps her. Then we go to Las Cruces at the bottom left. In the bottom left, that's Liz Kuchler. She's presenting a patient of hepatitis C to us. Then we go to the bottom right, that's Las Vegas, New Mexico. Over the course of about two hours, we co-manage about 10 to 12 patients of hepatitis C together. And we use 15 minutes of the two hours to give them a lecture on hepatitis C. So it's 15 minutes of lecture, and it's one hour and 45 minutes of case presentations in every echo clinic. It always occurs on Wednesday at 3 p.m. and goes till 5 p.m. This is called a knowledge network. No patient ever comes onto this network, and all case presentations are in de-identified ways. So it's, like, it's not John Brown, it's a 45-year-old man with hepatitis C. We described a concept called a learning loop. And this is, how does a novice become an expert in ECHO? They learn from the advice that we give as specialists. They learn from the lectures that we give. They present one patient to the network in a week, but they learn on 10, 12, every week. In a year, they learn on 500 patients longitudinally. But mostly, they learn by doing. How many of you have actually taught your son or daughter to drive a car? Can you raise your hand? Good, lots of you. So if I told you you could give your daughter lectures on how to drive a car, <laughs> give them access to a book on how to drive a car, and then you give them a written test, and she gets 100% of the questions right, how many of you would feel comfortable giving her the keys to the car? Right? You know, I ask this question everywhere in the world, basically, and nobody ever raised their hand except I was giving a plenary talk at the American Academy of Pediatrics in Washington, just about you know, an hour away from here. And like I'd, I'd asked this question over like three years, and nobody had raised their hand. And there was a 13-year-old girl sitting in the front row with her mother who raised her hand. So there is one person in the world who believes she could drive a car on that, that, that much experience. But the point I'm trying to make is, in this complexity, if you're trying to transmit the knowledge and expertise to manage complexity to rural clinicians, to rural nurses, to rural quality improvement teams, it's going to be hard to do it with just didactic training. We need guided practice to master complexity. Exactly what you do with your daughter, you sit next to her, she drives the car, and you give her gentle feedback, always trying to make sure <laughs> you don't mess up the relationship, <laughs> while she improves. And then we collect data and we monitor outcomes. So we give these rural clinicians no cost continuing medical education credits, nursing credits. We want to give them professional interaction with colleagues with similar interest. We want to bring a mix of work and learning. So, you know, as you know, I know you're from many, many parts of the country, there is a huge problem in this country of rural clinician turnover. This is a quality nightmare. Why? Because you don't, many of them, you know, they don't have electronic records fully. They have charts this big, and an 80-year-old woman comes in, she gets Motrin, ibuprofen. And guess what? She starts having gastrointestinal bleeding, goes into the hospital, is admitted there for 12 days, almost dies, and then she recovers, right? She goes home. And then the doctor leaves, right? 
And you know, four or five years later, three other doctors have passed. The paper chart has become this thick. Another doctor comes, and the 80-year-old woman comes back to the doctor and says, you know, I have this tremendous joint pain. Guess what he does? Prescribes ibuprofen again. So this turnover is a huge problem. And so we wanted to understand this, and we asked ourselves, uh, we did some focus groups with rural clinicians. They said, why is it that you know, there's so much problem with turnover? And they said, look, there's no Bloomingdale's here, and there's no Albuquerque Academy here. So we said, OK, we can't fix that. But then they said something interesting. They said, when we went to medical school and residency, it was a good mix of work and learning. But essentially, when they went to a rural area, it was all work one patient after another without the opportunity to be a part of a learning community, without an opportunity for getting trained and getting guided practice, which is the way they had gained expertise. So what happens is, if you don't have that expertise, you don't have the learning community, you can stagnate as a healthcare professional. Because it's very difficult to just read New England Journal of Medicine papers and then apply that into your practice. That's really, really hard. And so I asked, why is it that you know, everybody else in the world can work 40 hours a week and not get frustrated if they don't have learning going on? So you know, I came up with a hypothesis. One of my daughters is actually a, a medicine resident, uh, was just finished her residency at Yale. And by the way, she's a um, mentee of Harlan Crumbles, who was mentioned here. And uh, you know, when everybody else went to the prom, this is a very studious group of people. They went to the library. So, you know, if you put them in a completely isolated place where there's no learning, they do tend to get frustrated. So we said, how we can fix this problem. We can bring a learning community to you where you practice and give you access to multiple experts. The technology that our rural clinicians and urban clinicians need is very simple. We have an in-cloud video conferencing solution. The only thing they need is a webcam and broadband internet, which now they even have in developing countries. And we give them access to our disease management tools. We've done 600 such teleco clinics. More than 6,000 people have entered our disease management program. We provided 74,000 hours of CME credit to New Mexico clinicians alone. Around the world, we have provided millions of hours of continuing medical education credit. In New Mexico alone, we do ECHO for 19 different areas. So the first thing we wanted to study was self-efficacy. The scale here is one, I have no skill. Seven, I'm an expert who can teach others. We asked 25 clinicians, what's your ability to identify suitable candidates for treatment? Goes from 2.8 out of seven to 5.6 in 12 months. What is your ability to treat hepatitis C and manage side effects? Two to 5.2 in 12 months. Can you manage psychiatric comorbidities, 2.6 to 5.1? Can you serve as a local consultant within your clinic and in your area, 2.4 to 5.6? This is a really important question. There are more than 3,000 clinicians in New Mexico. If you remember, I only set up 21 centers of excellence for treating hepatitis C. How would this make a huge difference? It couldn't, except in one circumstance, that these 21 centers of excellence would accept referrals from everyone in the community. And that's exactly what happened. I made no effort to make that happen, no advertising, nothing. It just automatically, we set up the centers of excellence, and all patients in that area with that problem started migrating there to these centers to get treatment. Somehow, the word spread in the community. Overall competence goes from 2.8 to 5.5. These are very large effect sizes. Typically, anything over 0.8 effect size is considered significant. We wanted to understand the question. We knew access was improving. The reason I knew that was the wait in my clinic over 18 months fell from eight months to two weeks, basically. So we knew access was improving, but the real issue was, do doctors and nurse practitioners find this really useful? So we studied that. This and more data for other diseases is published in Health Affairs in June of 2011. But 
We ask them, is enhanced knowledge beneficial to you? 97%. Being well informed about symptoms? 94%. Achieving competence? 98% felt this was beneficial to them for their own practice. They wanted to be part of a learning community. We did this study in 2005, just one year after ECHO had started. I only had 17 centers of excellence at that time. We asked them, is Project ECHO diminished your professional isolation, 4.3 out of 5, enhanced my professional satisfaction, 4.8, benefit to my clinic, 4.9, expands access to treatment in my community, 4.9 out of 5. The next question is critical. Access in general to specialty expertise is a major area for need for me in my clinic, 4.9 out of 5. Why is this important? In the United States, we have more specialists than any other country in the world, basically. We have 50 times more specialists per capita than many African countries. If in the United States, rural and urban clinicians are saying that for poor people, it is difficult for them to access specialized expertise. Remember, they're not saying specialists. It's the expertise that they need. It's not the specialist. They can't access it. You can imagine what is happening. Some people tell me my goal of a billion people is too ambitious. Actually, it's not, because our estimate is that six billion people in the world don't have access to the right knowledge at the right place of the time, right time. It leads to tens of millions of excess deaths every year. This is a huge problem. It's the kind of problem, it's the kind of deaths that occur in world wars, basically. Absence of the right knowledge is a very catastrophic problem for any patient, no matter where he lives. So, of course, you know, it's not good enough for a doctor to really feel, oh, I really enjoy myself participating in ECHO. I am really, really satisfied professionally. The real issue is, can they do as good a job as a multidisciplinary team at a university? So we studied that and published this in the New England Journal of Medicine in June of 2011. Paper was called Outcomes of Treatment for Hepatitis C Virus Infection by Primary Care Providers. The objectives were to train primary care clinicians in rural areas and prisons to show that such care is as safe and effective as a university clinic and that we can improve access to care for minorities. The last part is very important because we have a major problem with health equity in the United States. No matter when, whenever I see a study comparing access of minorities to best practice care, access of poor people, I find huge differences between the majority, between affluent people and poor people. And that was also true for hepatitis C. The rates of treatment in African Americans were much lower than whites. Of course, in both cases, they were enormously low. Even today, only 18% of the hepatitis C population in the United States has been treated. So we did this study, prospective study, funded by AHRQ, where we took 21 intervention sites, community-based clinicians, 16, five prison clinics. Control was the University of New Mexico liver clinic. The principal endpoint was a sustained viral response. This means we would treat for a year with interferon injections, and then six months after we finished treatment, we would measure virus. If there was no virus, this is a permanent cure. This is a virus that can be cured forever, for life. Even if a patient had cirrhosis of the liver when we cured them, that means they were about going to die from that problem. If we cured them, there was a 93% reduction in likelihood of dying from liver failure and a 70% reduction in likelihood of developing liver cancer over 10 years. Many, many years of life would be added. These are the results. Minorities were 68% in ECHO, 49% university. Cure rate of genotype 1 was 50% and echo 46% university. Genotype 2, 3 was 70 and 71%, the same. So no difference, basically. We were able to show that rural primary care clinicians deliver hep C care under the aegis of echo that is as safe as effective as a university. And then we can improve access to care for New Mexico minorities. The more interesting finding of this study was the following. The cure rates were higher than when specialists in the United States were treating hepatitis C. The VA had just reported in hepatology, for genotype 1, their cure rate was only 20% across the country in 150 hospitals. And we said maybe veterans are a different population. 
sicker slightly, and so maybe that accounts for part of the difference. So we looked at a very large study where private practice gastroenterologists treated hepatitis C. Their cure rate was 34%. It was inconceivable. This difference was difficult to explain, but we believe that when you treat a patient close to their home in a culturally appropriate setting by doctors whom they know and trust, when they don't have to travel long distances, and when you can include behavioral health. Thank you. When you can integrate behavioral health with physical health, it makes a huge difference in care. And the reason is, when a patient is feeling sick getting chemotherapy, and if they get depressed, and they say life isn't worth living, why would they take this chemotherapeutic drug which is causing side effects? And that's not happening adequately in the health system. People tell me in our endocrinology echo projects for diabetes that one of the most important predictors for hemoglobin A1C level is not insulin dose, it's depression. If you're depressed, you're not going to control your diabetes well. So integrating behavioral health is one of the core properties of the ECHO project, and we include behavioral health in all ECHO projects for chronic disease. We later showed in Washington, D.C., that overall cost per discounted quality of life year gained was $3,500, and in 60% of the patients, it was cost saving. That's all you'll hear about hepatitis C, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> we then described six criteria. We said if the disease was common, if management was complex, if new treatments were coming, high societal impact, if there are serious outcomes of untreated disease, and if you have effective treatment, you could use this model very effectively. Here I want to show you two ideas. One is the Pareto's principle. This is the 80-20 rule. This is, I'll come back to that. This basically says that 20% of diseases will account for 80% of the morbidity mortality. When I look at the 121 harms that is occurring per 1,000 admissions, I can almost guarantee that 20% of the harms are account 20% of the problems are accounting for 80% of all the harms that are occurring to patients. And I'll come back to a strategy of how to tackle that, tackle that problem later on. But remember the Pareto's principle, how these things, I don't know for a fact that that's true, that a few problems account for most of those harms in hospital, but I guess that to be true, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong. The second idea I want to show here is bridge building, is that currently in the United States and everywhere in the world, healthcare is in silos. We provide different care in a rural hospital, different care at mass general hospital, different care in health departments. What we are saying is, by using technology, best practices, case-based learning, and outcomes tracking or measurement, as you call it, we can provide the same level of care no matter where you're seen. This is the second most important slide in my presentation. It's called force multiplier. Remember I mentioned there were six billion people who can't access best practice. You cannot double the number of specialists in the world. If you did that just like that and you were doubled, right? So what? Now 5.7 billion people won't have access to best practice care. Instead of 10 million dying every year, 8 million will die every year. You need 10 times. You need 10 times capacity expansion if you want to solve the world's problem. How do you do that? If you can have a nurse provide the same level of care as a super specialist by using an existing community clinician who lives there, I'll show you some examples of that, then you're going to get 10 times. And that's what you need if you want to change the world. So in New Mexico, we expanded ECHO to hepatitis C, to diabetes, endocrinology, rheumatology, chronic pain, addictions, mental health, tuberculosis, uh, complex care, HIV, bone health for osteoporosis, falls, fractures, etc. We have 400 points of contact in New Mexico for ECHO. The vision is in each town, at the bottom right is a town called Carlsbad. We want to create one expert in hepatitis C, one in rheumatology, one in HIV, one in substance use disorders, one in chronic pain, so they can create a self-sustaining network so the right knowledge exists at the right place at the right time as opposed to people moving to get care. This is our integrated addiction. 
and Psychiatry Echo, where we set up sites everywhere in New Mexico. When we started Echo for addiction and mental health in 2005, out of 3,000 clinicians in New Mexico, only 32 of them had a special DEA number to prescribe a medicine called Suboxone or Buprenorphine. This is a very big, important advance for opioid addiction, but only 1% of the providers had the license to do it, and they were all in Albuquerque or Santa Fe. So if you were in rural New Mexico, you were out of luck. So we used the ECHO model, as I've described, to scale up this capacity and trained another 400 clinicians to prescribe. So we went from 32 to 432. And the bottom line here is the entire United States where rural, low-income, Hispanic neighborhoods, on average, they have about 30 doctors per million population who can prescribe buprenorphine. The top line is New Mexico. The vertical line is when ECHO starts. And you can see now we have five times as many clinicians who can prescribe buprenorphine in New Mexico than the rest of the country. That's an example of force multiplication. So what's the real problem? This is the real problem. Medical knowledge is improving exponentially. Whereas the learning capacity of human beings is only going up slowly with time at an evolutionary pace and may actually be going down with aging. This is the problem because what a patient needs is on the top of that curve and what a doctor knows is the bottom of that curve. <laughs> There's kind of a challenge, isn't it? You don't have to be poor to get trapped in this gap. You can be rich and get trapped in this gap if your doctor doesn't know what to do. If a doctor is standing in front of a bed in a rural New Mexico and he's about to write, he has to, four minutes later he has to go to the order station and put an order in for this patient who's admitted to the hospital and he doesn't know what the right thing to do is, he doesn't have that knowledge he needs, guess what? A harm is just about to occur. That knowledge could exist in the next room, it could exist on the next floor, it could be in the hospital somewhere. It's not enough. It needs to be in his head right there and then because without the right knowledge at the right place at the right time, quality will suffer in a big way. The second problem on this curve is this. Medical knowledge is increasing exponentially because of the effect of technology, computers, Moore's law, genomics. Whereas our knowledge distribution methodology is linear. We go and give lectures to doctors. They read articles in the New England Journal of Medicine to change their practice. So now you have a problem, logarithmic increases in knowledge and linear distribution methodology. This is going to be a problem. So first of all, I want to applaud all of you. Congratulations on this absolutely breakthrough. Dennis Wagner gave me this slide, and thank you, Dennis. This is breakthrough improvement. You know, Only very dedicated people like you working day and night can achieve this. 145 harms per 1,000 discharges to 121 harms. We still have a challenge, though. One in nine patients getting admitted to a US hospital is harmed. This is very far away. I'm afraid to go to a hospital. It's kind of a dangerous place. Compare this to Six Sigma, one in a million defects and then one in nine defects. Are we in healthcare sloppy? Are we less smart? Are we less intelligent? I don't think so. This is a different problem. This is a problem of complexity. Are we less motivated? Is it because the payment system is wrong? Yeah. Improving the payment system will help the situation. Improving the payment system will help the situation. Better measurement will definitely help the situation. Better information technology will help the situation. But there's still one other problem, and that's this problem, that the person who's providing the care in that hospital on that day when the patient is lying in bed 
doesn't have the right knowledge at the right place at the right time. So here's an idea for you to consider as a group. What if we took the top 15 problems that cause harm, those 121 harms in the United States of America, and we put super specialty teams in every hospital who's, they're world-class experts. They're connected to an echo, a specialized echo for preventing falls, another specialized echo for preventing bed sores, another specialized echo for line sepsis, another specialized echo for C. diff. So you have a three-person team in the, C in the hospital where when an 85-year-old person comes into the hospital who's susceptible to a fall, this local team that connects to an echo for one hour a week, they have the world-class expertise, is immediately consulted to put in best practices to prevent that fall, to prevent bed sores, to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia, to prevent line sepsis, whatever be that problem that we want to solve, we have to figure out a way to reflect that best practice on the care of that 82-year-old woman right now, immediately, within minutes and hours of that admission occurring, that team has to descend. Now, we already have these teams at major university hospitals, but they don't have all this expertise in rural hospitals, and it's very, very difficult to bring all these teams there. ECHO can help by reducing the cost of and mentoring and keeping these teams alive and value trained. So what is the potential benefits of the ECHO model to the health system? Improved quality and safety, rapid learning best practice dissemination, reducing variation in care, improving access for rural and underserved patients, reducing disparities, workforce training, force multiplier, the idea of 10 times, improving professional satisfaction, supporting the medical home. The current medical homes as they are designed, I will submit to you, will result in improvement but not sufficient improvement. And the reason is, if you have a team that does the work, a multi you know, case manager, nurses, etc., but they don't have the specialized knowledge to take care of that patient, there's still that missing ingredient. Cost-effective care. Since you're CMS, I'll mention that in the United States, when a Medicaid patient comes to see me from Carlsbad, Medicaid will pay the university $100 to see me. And then they'll pay the transportation company $300 to transport him from Carlsbad to see me. That's not the best use of our time. The VA system uses more than $1 billion a year in transporting patients from community-based outpatient clinics to their VA medical centers. We want to prevent cost of untreated disease, like liver transplants, like dialysis. And I really enjoyed your comment. Thank you for sharing. We want to prevent cost of untreated disease by treating diabetes early, treating hepatitis C early, and integrating public health into treatment. What do we need to do to make all of this happen? We have to make a shift in our brain. Our current knowledge is that I'm a super specialist. I have a knowledge monopoly. I create value for myself and my family and my children through that monopoly by selling my knowledge in piecemeal fashion. If you're a patient, you need to see me. You come and see me for 10 minutes, and I charge you a few hundred dollars for that, and I dispense my knowledge in piecemeal fashion. This is very, very problematic for the six billion people. My role has to be to democratize my knowledge for the betterment of humanity. Otherwise, I'm trapped in my own calendar. My calendar is I can only help those people for whom I have an appointment slot, and I get capped out. But when I democratize my knowledge, I can have 10 times impact. This is Albuquerque. This is our hepatitis C program in New Mexico. These are the 400 points of contact for 20 different areas in New Mexico. These are all the universities in the United States that have replicated ECHO. University of Washington, Oregon, UCSF, uh, St. Joseph's, Arizona, University of Utah, Colorado, University of Chicago, Harvard, MD Anderson, Texas, Baylor, and many others. We have uh, almost 47 universities in the United States currently doing ECHO. This is the VA ECHO program, 11 university hubs connected to 600 clinics 
for 22 different disease areas. This is our partnership with the CDC PEPFAR program to bring better care for HIV in Namibia. I'm showing you these slides because even in a developing country, the technology exists to do ECHO. It doesn't need much. You just need broadband access. And most places have it in the United States. This is the Namibia HIV program in partnership with the government of the United States, basically where all the hospitals in Namibia, they have more than 100,000 HIV patients, can benefit. Because these streams in this echo clinic, more than 100 people from like 12 different sites are participating, learning on cases, how to manage patients, and developing expertise in HIV management in Namibia. This is the expert team in the capital helping all these people become experts and co-managing patients through guided practice. Again, Namibia. This is the use of ECHO project for quality. That, the first one was to improve quality of care for HIV. This is ECHO in Vietnam for improved quality of care in multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. All rural hospitals, 30, connected to Ho Chi Minh City expert, the, the national expert on management of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and his team, connected to all the rural hospitals, helping them manage and improve quality of care for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. This is our partnership with the CDC in Indian country. Good health and wellness in Indian country. 22 tribal organizations and tribes, all connected via ECHO, not for treating disease, but improving the culture of health, setting up basically parks, food, eliminating food deserts, exercise facilities, improving health of people. This is, should be interesting to you. This is a partnership with IHI, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI ECHO to test whether the ECHO model can be used to support training for quality improvement and complex des systems design. Focus is effective and efficient use of provider time, optimizing care teams, provide patient and staff satisfaction, removing waste, using data, measurement, training. These rural clinics don't, are not QI experts like you are. They need training. So a typical ECHO clinic here, again, the, it's a case presentation, but not of a patient. The case in this case is the system. There's a system problem. Long waits for patients. High no-show rates. These are 16 federally qualified health center organizations participating in this quality improvement echo. We have here in 12 countries now, uh, 70 echo hubs connected to thousands and thousands of clinics in countries like Canada, in Northern Ireland, in Brazil, Argentina, India, Jamaica, Namibia, and many, many other countries. The last slide I want to share with you, what is it that make, makes ECHO work? The first, team-based care. S second, task shifting is the ability of every human being work to work at the highest level of his human potential. What does that need? It needs two things. Guided practice, we talked about your daughter, and mentor-mentee relationships. We need a community of practice. ECHO is not a knowledge network, it's a social network to produce joy of work. This is a Don Berwick shared this concept with me. Joy of work is important to solve important problems in the world. The role of technology, this is not just a video canceling platform. The role of technology is to reduce the transaction cost of collaboration. Force multiplication is the idea of 10 times. Demonopolizing knowledge is essential. And knowledge expansion occurs when you create communities of practice. Because the teachers learn from the students as new knowledge is created when knowledge is applied in diverse settings. In order to reach a billion people, we cannot grow our organization enough. Organizations have limits to growth, very like, much like a petri dish. You get into a limit to growth. So we are trying to create a movement to change the world 
and create better health care. And I ask each one of you to join this movement to improve health care all over the world. I will not have time for questions, but I'll be here in the break if somebody wants to speak to us about collaborations or other questions. But I also want to introduce you to Dr. Carissa Lin, who's the Chief Operating Officer of ECHO, and she'll be here for the whole conference. Um, and, um, and thank you all for your attention. And Dennis, thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to speak to this audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, that was really something. Um, thank you. Uh, we want to take a few moments and just process what we heard from Dr. Aurora. So I want to invite you to answer two questions. So I want to encourage you to maybe turn to the person you're sitting next to and discuss your answer to these two questions. And then we're going to come back and here's some of your answers, and maybe if you have a question or two for Dr. Aurora, we've got about eight minutes to do this. So take two minutes, here are the two questions. What's the number one insight that I got from Dr. Aurora? Number one insight. And the second question, how is this relevant to my work? I had Tom Evans grab me during Dr. Aurora's talk and said, we need to do this with the PTNs. We need to be doing this kind of standardization of the work with PTNs. So, Number one insight, how is this relevant to my work? Take two minutes and discuss, and we'll come back and hear what you've got to say. Go. That was really, really well done. <laughs> I hope it met your need. It's, it is. Yeah. It's a perfect audience for your talk. Uh, no, it is. No, I think I'm grateful to you for the opportunity, because as you know, you're trying to create a movement. And I need you as a partner every time. Partners, you know, we can't do it with ourselves. So by by allowing me to speak here, you allowed me the opportunity to expand the network, basically. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful that you're here, and I, I people were just absolutely blown away. You know, I'm sitting at the table here with a lot of senior leadership, CMS, Kate Goodrich, who you just heard from, Dean Willie Williams, my director, deputy director, Debbie Hattery. They're all just saying, "Oh my God, like we could do so much better." You know, we have. Wow. Billions of dollars that we spend on projects. Yeah, no, I, I would love to not doing it with a system of effort. I would love to help with that. I mean, you know, I, 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 I believe, like, that's why I was talking about it. I believe that you could use Echo to, uh, to really tackle that 121 number, oh, yeah. knock it to 60. Yeah. Yeah. I'm certainly happy to basically accept that challenge and make it happen. Yeah. Because I think it can happen. I think, I mean, I don't say, I'm not saying that I have a strategy for it, but I think if I put a straw man on the board and some QI experts join me, we can develop a strategy with that low cost can actually make that happen. I really believe that in my heart. Well, I'd love to talk further. Yeah. You know, we've got a ton of data. Um, yeah. And a lot of the, you know, like one of your pieces was that a lot of this harm is probably locked up in a few things. Yeah. And that's maybe, true. Maybe Adverse drug events, pressure yes. else a key hoop category. Yes, exactly. Um, that's they're the I categories mean. we've done the most improvement in. But um, that, that, it's huge. Um, yeah. So, okay. So let's, uh, okay. yeah. Okay. So if, if we could come back to the full group. And we just like to process this a little bit as a community the whole. We'd love to hear your answers. And some of you may have questions for either Dr. Um, Lynn or, or, or Dr. Ra uh, that can take place now or afterwards. We'd love to hear your answers, though. Our mic runners, uh, we have Mike here and here, and I think another in the back of the room. Very good. So we've got a hand right here in the front already. Um, so let, let's go there and tell us who you are, and we'd love to hear your answer. And please come. Yeah. Microphone up front. Yeah, now. No. My name is Kathy Day. I'm a patient representative today, patient safety advocate. And I just want to know how we get you to Maine. 
I missed that question. What did she I, say? I didn't. We Maine didn't hear. Was, Maine was one of the blank states on Maine. Yes, uh, we would love to do it in Maine. All right. Please reach out to me. We'll give you my card after the session, and um, let's talk. Great. Thank you. All right. You know, currently, the model doesn't have an effective payment system along with it. So usually, it's state Medicaid programs that support the university. In the state of Washington, the university is supported by the Department of Health to do this. In many places, the state legislature does that. But I actually had a conversation with Patrick Conway this morning. I think he referred to that, basically saying, is there a way that CMS can actually encourage major universities to do echo-like networks. And I, I'll tell you the fundamental. I'll tell you what the reason for that is, that currently what academic medical centers in the United States do is they are custodians of best practices in many areas. What they do is they train residents and fellows and send them out of the field, and then they just compete with them, right? Now, what I'm saying is, because of that knowledge curve that we showed, that's not sufficient for a resident to graduate and then be expected to learn the rest of his life on his own and then apply everything he reads in a journal to patients. It doesn't work. We need a new system of mentorship of the entire healthcare workforce for life in order to get better quality. And people should be incented, academic centers, specialists, to be incented to democratize and demonopolize knowledge rather than just using it in a fee-for-service mode for economic gain. Thank you. Question for Dr. Wagner. We actually are huge fans of Project ECHO. Sanji, thank you so much for your comments. We have several practices in Maine participating in the Community Health Center, ECHO for Pain and Bupe. And we actually wrote funding for Project ECHO into our original PTN proposal, and we were asked to take it out because the comment was that uh, CMS was going to provide some of these resources centrally. So it's really a challenge and a question back to CMS. Is there someone be great for universities to do this? But you know, they're not funded under this right now. So whether it's through the central contractor for PTNs or one of the SANs, it would be great to dedicate CMS funds to an evidence-based program like this, and we would hugely welcome it in our northern New England states. The only comment I have is, I said, from your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I promised Maddie that if we did Q's and A's, we'd end on time. We're right on time. I want to thank you all. I want to thank Dr. Aurora again. Well done.